welcome to Cinema Savvy. We are here today to talk about Spider-Man 2, which is of course the 2004 superhero sequel film directed by Sam Raimi and arguably uh, the best live action Spider-Man film, uh, potentially. I guess we'll find out in this review whether we think that's still the case or not. Uh, obviously in the lead up to a small film that's coming out this December called Spider-Man No Way Home, where hopefully, still fingers crossed, we didn't get it in the trailer. I think we were hypothesizing last week that we were going to get a glimpse. We didn't, sadly, but we're pretty confident they're going to show up in that film. Um, we're reviewing all the live action Spider-Man films, so there won't be any Into the Spider-Verse in this kind of little mini retrospective that we're doing, but we do have content on that. I think we have a watch along, we have a review, so if you're interested in our thoughts on that Spider-Man film, go and check that out. But um, yeah, we're we're at the midway point in the in the Raimi trilogy. We are loving life. Honestly, the first Spider-Man review that we did, uh, well, last week, well, technically the second review that we did on that film, we do have earlier reviews on all three of the Sam Raimi films, so again, do go and check those out. That was probably one of my favorite discussions we did last week. It was an absolute blast. I think we clocked in over two hours. And we'll see how we go on this one, because we have a lot of good things to say on this one too. But before we do so, over to George with the socials. Absolutely, guys. So comment below your thoughts on Spider-Man 2. Now, we can say that uh, Otto Octavius is in the new film, uh, being a, an awful pun used in the trailer. Awful joke line, sorry. But uh, we want to hear all your thoughts. Of course, we haven't got a formal announcement yet. We've recorded it before the trailer, as Chris said. So anything you think, we've done a reaction. We've got a playlist called James No Way Home. We've got the uh, the the Holland films on there. We're not, we're not going to have time to review them before the new one's out. So we already had to alter our schedule for the UK release date as well, which is worth saying. Mm -hmm. All of these every Wednesday, but Amazing Spider-Man 2 will be a couple of days before if the Wednesday is the UK release date for No Way Home. We get to watch it early, so what America. But as we said, hit that subscribe button. Not that I've just insulted all of you. And of course, hit the like button or dislike <laughs> if you're fuming. Because guess what? The awful new YouTube update, dislikes don't matter anymore. Drop as many as you want. Um, that being said, obviously don't drop dislikes if you don't want to. But we've got a lot of videos coming up. We've, we've ticked a big a big few ones off this week. We've had a pretty insane week pre-recording already, and it's only Tuesday. So uh, if you want to find out what videos are coming, your best way of finding out is getting us on social media, Twitter at cinema underscore savvy, Facebook and letterbox.com slash cinema savvy, and we have a link to Public in the description below. That being said, um, Spider-Man 2. Uh, we're gonna, we always talk about our memories of these, but we've kind of said for this one, we're going to kind of not split it in two, but we're going to do what we did last time for the last film. We're going to talk about our memories younger, and then probably the last four or five years, the, the resurgence, we keep calling it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really good way to start. So, Chris, handing over to you, do you remember your memories of this one? I do. And, um, you know, to my shame, to my embarrassment, I didn't see this at the cinema. And I'm still gutted to this day that I never went to see this at the cinema. And I don't know why I didn't, because by this point, 12 A's were a thing, right? We talked about that, that Spider-Man 1 was definitely one of the biggest proponents in film that managed to sort of swing that, um, no pun intended, uh, 12 A certificate for films. I could have gone to have seen this film. I was 11 years old when this came out, I think 2004. Yeah, I'd have been about 11 years old. Um, but unfortunately, I didn't get to see it at the cinema. Uh, what I did see it on, and I don't condone this, ladies and gentlemen, so don't do as I don't what do as I say, not as I do, or whatever I'm saying. Um, I watched this on pirate copy, which is not the way to watch Spider Man 2. So, back in the day, I think I was in year six, I want to say, at school or something like that. There was a kid who was like, You name it, my dad can get it for you. Any film you want, like, I can get it. And I think around that time, I asked for Kill Bill Volume 2 and Spider-Man 2. And he kept saying, like, oh, I'll bring it in tomorrow. And then tomorrow came and he never did. And the film was out. And I was like, dude, I want to see Kill Bill 2. And I want to see Spider-Man 2. It was like, oh, yeah, no, I, I forgot. I'll bring it in the day after. And it was like day after day after day. I think a week went by. And I remember, like, I was horrible to this kid at school. This is this is like going in personal. I was like, you don't have it, do you? You're just like bullshit and you're lying. Like, you don't have these films. Why, you know? And I think I got him on the verge of tears. I like, I gave him an ultimatum. I was like, I want those films tomorrow. You promise me. Lo and behold, he did bring them in. So, you know, maybe I was a little bit too hard on him. But I did get those films. Unfortunately, they were in copies. And I don't remember ever having that you know oh my god this film has completely rocked my world blew me away kind of thing i think i really had that feeling once i got it on home video and i had it on dvd two disc dvd i think all my spider-man films that i have the raimi trilogy are two disc ones uh and i think around that time as well 2004 that was when dvd was really coming into its own that was like the prime sort of year i think for dvd for me and another big tie in like the nostalgia for me with this is still 
probably, if it ain't my number one, it's definitely in my top three movie tie-in games of all time, Spider-Man 2 game on PS2. That game was colossal for me. I used to rush back from school to play it. And it was one of those games where, like Grand Theft Auto Vice City or San Andreas, you know, the story mode was great and you could do that, you could follow that. But it's a game that you could just put on and just swing around the city and not really do anything. You could do side missions. I'd never seen a game of that scope before. That was the game where I was like, I genuinely feel like Spider-Man playing this. There were moments where you jump off from like the Empire State Building, you get that sense of vertigo. It really nailed the swing mechanic. And it, it it's still one of my favorite games. It's still one of the most nostalgic games for me uh, on the entire platform of the PS2, which thankfully, you know, has had a resurgence now with the PS4 version, which has captured a lot of that magic, I think, for a lot of people and the nostalgia for people that did grow up with that Spider-Man 2 game. They've managed to find a new audience with this PS4 one, which I still need to play. It's still on the back burner. I will one day, although what I've seen looks phenomenal. So that's kind of my memories of Spider-Man 2. Obviously, when I did watch it on DVD, it's by far and above like one of my favorite sequels of all time, one of my favorite superhero films of all time. But I never had that initial rush of excitement burst when I first saw it, probably because I watched it on a, a really dodgy pirate copy. And pirate copies back in the day, these weren't like your downloaded torrented streams that people have got like early access to or anything. You'd have pe you'd have silhouettes of people getting up and going to the bathroom or going to get yeah. concessions or something. You know the ones. We all had them. You're lying if you never said that you had them. But yeah, they're my earliest Spider-Man 2 memories, I think. Mine's... Um quite different i mean i did see it at the cinema but i'll tell you this i i don't have any memory of seeing it at the cinema itself so this is a really weird thing saying i i was seven turning eight. this is june 04 i think i was seven turning eight yeah. and one of my aunties would always take me and my sisters out she didn't have kids at the time she would get weekends with her and stuff like that and she'd always take us to cinema 100 percent as a kid some of the biggest ones ever as growing up aunties would always take us as well as my parents and i remember distinctly going down the escalators if anyone knows solly hall uh it's not where i live but the the cinema at solly hall which is still there because i had to go a couple months ago for the spark brothers um i showed this i just remember coming out going down the escalators and there was a humongous cardboard cutout of the spider-man 2 poster but even better than that this is one of the biggest regrets i've ever had and anyone that knows empire magazine knows this um a part of the time is like my own call and he bought me Empire Magazine for Spider-Man 2, and I believe that was voted their best ever cover. Mm -hmm. I think it's the background we're using now uh, of him webbing towards it, but it was 3D, you know, when you get the plastic yeah. layer of 3D. Yeah. Uh, and I had it as a kid, and for whatever reason, I don't have it anymore, so I'm going to assume that it got binned when when my parents probably like changed my room or something when I was quite little, so not that I was little, I was eight, but... That's something I always get annoyed upon, and I think it's quite expensive if you look at it on eBay that magazine because mm -hmm. it's such a famous Empire cover. But I, I don't have again like, like some films I can I can t I told said loads about Spider Man One. I remember the whole process, the the, the blood bit, and all that. And Spider Man Two just kind of happened, and I was like, ah, and like I I liked it, but it, well, I liked the Green Goblin. It wasn't Spider Man One. I got the DVD like you, you know, the one the red case as well. Mm -hmm. We ordered the red cases, and I would watch it. And uh, up to the point where I upgraded to Blu-ray, I used to laugh. It reached a point where I'm sick and fed up of the Hellboy trailer, um, which was on that same <laughs> DVD. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I'm, and I think Spider-Man Three was um, that Will Ferrell film. Um, oh, I've forgotten which one it's called. Whether he tries to do a drama and it didn't work. But uh, that being said, yeah, my memory is this: I, I didn't have a PS2. We've had this chat. I do have Spider-Man Two now behind me. The game. Not played it yet, and I've recently oh, had yeah, actually. Oh man! Please well, I was I was gonna play it, and I ended up just downloading the, the PS5 version of Spider Man, and ended up playing like I I platinumed it last week. So hmm. I I do now need to revert back to PS2. But hey, I That's got to play another PS5. That's gonna be tough. Yeah, to back. It's, it's tough, but I'm 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 happy to give it a go because I did think it was there. It's like you know, I almost completed Spider Man one a couple of months ago. I should have I should have gone straight on to two, but. It, this has been a film. I said we're going to split into that. I, I said I always enjoyed it, but I I didn't appreciate it till I got older. And I think the, certainly this film more than any of the others. We'll get into that obviously the, the characters and stuff later. But this is I think the reason I didn't enjoy it much as a kid is because you know it wasn't all action, it wasn't all not not memes. It's still it's nowadays, but you, you don't get there as a kid. But because this is inherently a film about Peter Parker more so than Spider Man. As a kid, you love all the Green Goblin, the swing and the fighting, but this is really the core of a film about Peter Parker. And 
I think that's the beauty of this film is it's grown up. It's still appealing for kids. I don't have any of the Lego sets, but I remember they had the Lego Otto's warehouse at the end that I wanted at Toys R Us and never got. And I think it's worth hundreds now, so that's my parents lost not doing that. And uh, <laughs> and a couple of other things, but I just, yeah, I, I didn't have massive connections to it. And I'm, I always kind of think, you know, there's something I, I like now. That's, why don't I like it at the time? I, obviously, I liked it, but there wasn't really anything in like summer of 04 that springs to mind you know there wasn't a star wars film that was 2005 and normally if i'm not big on a film it's because something else has come out and i just pull an absolute blank on it as to what happened that summer so i don't, I don't really know but i have to check yeah no i, I can't yeah. remember anything off the top of my head i'm not good with dates anyway so i'd have to like i'd have to check if anything came out that year but um but yeah it's, talk- it's just and, and i think it's just you know for anything else it's just a perfect sequel it really yeah. is. You know, obviously we'll get into sort of like the modern day ramifications because with this new Spider-Man film out, there's a hell of a lot. Um, you know, Jesus Christ, Dr. Octopus, like need I say more, or like an actual continuation, we, we guess, of his story from this film. But it's it does everything that, you know, most sequels try and do and absolutely fail at. You know, a lot of sequels come out and it's like, right, we've got to go bigger, more impressive, more louder, more explosions. We've just got to up the ante with the action. And this film absolutely does that. Like, you can see the extra money on the screen with this film. Like, the stuff that they, you know, the um, the stunt work, the effects, like, had vastly improved since the first film. The digital doubles, which, you know, by 2021 standards aren't that great, sort of going back in some of the shots in this film. But you appreciate what they were trying to do. The way that the action's shot choreographed everything it just looks so much more visually impressive than the first film and it's literally two years later but on top of that you know most films just kind of rely on the action side there is still a story to be told there and it's a perfect continuation of everything that was built up from the first film and it continues it in a believable and fulfilling way you know it 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 keeps peter parker at the forefront of the film uh dealing with his you know his constant conflict about you know what he wants from a personal life against his superhero life um all the other supporting characters including new ones are fantastic and you know a sympathetic villain as well which i don't know if that was a new thing when this film came out but certainly a lot of people when they talk about the villain of this film that's the the first thing that they go to is you know it's a really empathetic sympathetic villain who has a lot of layers and depth to them has that connection with spider-man but is also a very tragic villain now i mean there's probably a lot of other superhero films that had done a tragic villain before but I don't know. I'm guessing with Doc Ock, it kind of like hit new strides. And it's like all these ticks with this film, you know, I actually think this is a perfect film. I genuinely think this is a perfect film. I can't really think of any overall negatives that I can have with it. Um, It's just so solid across the board that even to this day, it's regarded as one of the best superhero films ever made. You know, one of the best sequels ever made. Um, Certainly one of the best films within its genre. And I absolutely think, you know, almost almost close to it almost 20 years on it it still fulfills that it's still you know head and shoulders above loads of films that come out today for me oh yeah absolutely and this is the thing with this film is that i don't think in 04 you can not appreciate how good it is i'm sure people that were probably our age in 04 knew this is a great film but in 2004 you didn't have what 10 comic book films out a year marvel versus dc 14 a franchise or whatever they're gearing up towards now and it was. It's a new film that's based on Spider Man, and it got everything so right. This paved the way for a lot of things. I'm, I'm not to sort of get boring about uni stuff, but when I was at college, we had to like a, a like a you know the essay, news nonsense. Pick two mm-hmm. things and go decide for them. And I pick always pick Spider Man Two and The Dark Knight, and you know, the two films yeah. that kind of redefined it into the audience and films we have now. And you, you said it's a perfect film. I, I think it's fair. So I'm going to give you right now. There's not one bad scene in this film. Yeah. You, you mentioned the CG as well. It's always interesting looking back in 04, but you, everything you said there, and it's a two year gap, that's that early 2000s boom that CGI mm-hmm. is going at such a pace that no one can catch up with. That you look at the, the leap from 99 to 2009 of technology and film, it's unbelievable. Whereas like 2009 to 2021, there's not been much change by probably The Mandalorian, which has been the last like two years. And this essay is to be written by kids these days, not us on stuff like that, so they can go <laughs> do them. But, um, it won an Oscar as well. It's worth saying that yeah. it won best visual effects and John Darkstra back at the helm and all that kind of stuff. So I get I'm not aggravated when people want to try and dish it, but oh, it doesn't look good. It's like, well, yeah, it's 2004. It's not going to look like your new Spider Man film. And judging off the trailer of the new Spider Man film, it doesn't look perfect either. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm, we'll get into Doc or later, but the Hello Pete line, the CGI looks absolutely abysmal. Whereas when we get shots of him properly, like in the new trailer, it looks pretty great when he's like throwing the things. So 
it's a really interesting one, but just going back to this, I think its reputation is so well deserved. And it's a shame that some people try and like take the piss out of this one. And yes, there's memes in it, but as far as a film goes, it is the best one by Marlon. And what we kind of spoke about, you get the you know, not just the memes nowadays, but this has a story and Spider-Man 1, we said, it, it's the perfect origin. It is an origin film. It services the, the concept of an origin perfectly. This is what you want from a sequel. You need to up the stakes whilst developing characters and not just your lead character, as you mentioned, a sympathetic villain. We've got so many supporting characters in this. They all get their screen time. They're all earned. And it progresses the, the, the plot forwards as to the end point. You know, it ends with him with MJ, spoiler alert. And that's something that's been earned over two films. It's not trying to throw it all in really quickly. So it's really interesting looking back now at how many films don't not fo- don't follow this trend. But when you've got the the ingredients for a perfect comic book film, and ninety percent of the comic book films copy each other, it's, I always find it very surprising. Not many have really tried to copy this. Instead, now mm-hmm. they all they all go for the origin concept and then bring it's more a dark night, I guess. They go for the dark origin night, concepts. Yeah. Then you bring in your, your big A list villain for the second film, not the first one. I think we spoke about that last week, didn't we? Mm-hmm. And then the third one's the the, the the big up moment, and you know, two couldn't be more different. Dark Knight and Spider Man Two, but it's the director's visions that make both of those films, which is worth saying. And I don't know if this is a good segue into Sam Raimi, but um, you know, these films don't work without him. They don't exist mm-hmm. without him. This is all on him. And only seeing the quality of the Spider Man films since. Have you realized that how missed he is? Mm-hmm. And I would even argue if people want to get into Spider Man 3, you'll have to come back next week for that one. But everybody knows what went wrong with Spider Man 3. It was Sam Raimi being told, You're doing Venom, not mm-hmm. Lizard, who's been set up. Well, that's been Spider Man 4, but he wanted to do a film about Harry Osborn becoming the Green Goblin, which is exactly how this film leaves it. And I'll tell you what, that has triggered a memory in me. Eight year old George, here's the Green Goblin theme when he throws the, the dagger through the wall. That was a moment I fucking freaked out in a good way mm-hmm. because you know how much I love the Green Goblin and we got the helmet. That that's just triggered a memory watching that. So the um, sequel baiting, yeah, no, it it, it was it teed up for a really interesting. It wasn't place a term back then, and this this was what you know, it's an eight year old kid, a seven year old kid. That wasn't a term, and I was like, oh my god, he's going to become the Green Goblin. Mm-hmm. And then the film finished. I was like, I was like, what, what do you do? And you know, at that and age, then our you're wait began three years. That was yeah. our that was our Return of the Jedi, wasn't it? In many yeah, ways. And, and and you know, th- th- thanks, Avi Arad. That's what I'm going to say to that one. Anyway, sorry not to rant aside. Uh, Sam Raimi. Yeah, no, I mean this film probably out of all three has the most Raimi-ish scene out of any Sam Raimi scene. Obviously, we'll probably talk about it more with Doc Ock, but the terrifying bit, and I remember that having an impact with me, and it still kind of makes me grit my teeth now. It gets very grisly. I actually think it's extended in the 2.1 version, which I still haven't seen beginning to end. I've seen like a couple of the scenes, like the extra bits. I think there's like a bit of an extra fight on the clock tower with Doc Ock. There's the scene with J.K. Simmons where he puts on the Spider-Man suit, which is a step too far, I think. So I'm glad that that was cut for the theatrical. And then I think there's like an extended, um, I think it's a little bit more grisly, a little bit, I don't know, necessarily gory, but I mean, that's that's Evil Dead 2, like the camera angle, like the crash zoom on the chainsaw, the, the trying to cut the arm off and everything. That's Evil Dead 2 right there. So it's nice to see that even though, you know, it's it's a fantastic superhero film and everything's firing on all cylinders, Raimi still gets that, you know, he gets to flex his artistic muscle and kind of go back to some of the cheesiest scenes. There's a montage in this with raindrops keep falling on my head, which is intentionally cheesy but it's it's nice and it adds to the mood of it and it, it's just Raimi through and through even down to the wacky side characters and whatnot and um oh boy we'll get onto the side characters later on because definitely some fan favorites on this one but yeah in terms of no. Bond Day like the impact of the film that it still has I obviously No Way Home is going to be massive for this film but the nostalgia is there and I think that a lot of people have held this film near and dear you know a lot of people who might only know the Tom Holland films, you know, and say, what's your favorite Spider-Man film? They might say Far From Home or Homecoming, but I think a lot of people, you know, not to take away from Spider-Man 1, because what that did for the genre, Spider-Man 3, a lot of people are kind of negative on. I can understand where they're coming from, although I enjoy it. Spider-Man 2 is always that, like, holy grail of a Spider-Man film, and it's only really until Into the Spider-Verse has come out where I say where there's, genu- you know, genuine contention as to what is the best Spider-Man film, but I think it is always that divide between animated and live action, and I think you're always going to have that divide. I don't think you can kind of equate them on the same level in many ways, 
but genuinely, you know, we'll probably talk more about the action and everything. Um, the, the Raimi films, I don't think that they have captured Spider-Man on screen in terms of the action, the spectacle, feeling like you're there with Spider-Man swinging through the city. I don't think any other Spider-Man films have captured it as, you know, Sam Raimi did with the trilogy. Yeah, and that's a really big thing because we always sort of laugh at the Holland films that, you know, I mean, I know it's in, the, it's in the trailer for the new one, but we didn't get to see him swinging in New York yeah. until he popped up in Infinity War. Yeah. His own films hadn't done it, and it is one of them that not are you scared to do it, you shouldn't be scared to have Spider-Man swinging. It's, it's his job, it's what he does for a living, but I'd say the Sp- Amazing Spider-Man 2 had some good swinging bits, but you know that that's the, I'm not saying it's bad that it's CGI, but certainly that film, the the, the was that film's issues is completely fully story and everything else that's not swinging. Uh, it got some things right, like costume it got right. We'll get to yeah. that eventually, but no, I think you're right. Spider-Man 2 is the, 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 the definitive Spider-Man film. I think most people do hold up on that regard, but I think because you've got the perfect origin film, you want the perfect sequel, and the fact it delivered that, and then obviously we'll get to Spider-Man 3 next week, and it's it's just one of them where I don't... You mentioned Raimi, you mentioned the horror scene. He, he can do all of it. He can make you fear for characters. He can make you... You know, it's not just telling the story, but it's about the emotions you have as a viewer. He can make you laugh at scenes. He can make you angry, upset, scared. He covers everything. And all of that, to me, comes down to Tobey Maguire. Now, I'm not saying this is a Leonardo DiCaprio performance, but, you know, the, the conversation with Spider-Man, and I think Batman has it to an extent, but I don't think it's as hotly regarded because there's been so many, uh, so many Batmans right now. But you always get, you know, who's the best Spider-Man? Or you break down and say, who is the best Spider-Man? And who is the best Peter Parker? Mm-hmm. And you know the correct answer is Tobey Maguire, both. But <laughs> it's it's one of them where you look at as the years have gone by, you just go back to this film, and it just it captures what the the meaning of the character is. That you know this is a film about Peter Parker as well as Spider Man, and there's so much going on in this. And you know again, it's it's I think it's a very underrated performance because he's very good in it. But he has to revert back to being the nerdy Peter Parker at times, the current Peter Parker at times, whilst trying to be Spider-Man and, and sort of composing it all together. And I think it can be easy to laugh and smirk and there is humour, but, you know, I just think of some of those scenes where we'll get to Art May later on, but there's a, another big important scene with a, with a long shot camera in the house. Mm-hmm. But I, I just think in this that they nailed it. And I think that if the actor doesn't work, it won't, I, uh, not to sort of shit on Tom Holland, but He's been a pretty terrible Peter Parker. Has he been right for him in the suit? Yeah, fine. A guy feels fantastic in the suit as well. But they don't capture that because the concept of the character is that he is an everyday person that's struggling with life, with bills, with money. He's not raised in a rich family, in a rich household. He has always had the humble background, living with his aunt and his uncle for whatever reason you can interpret that to be. And he has to deal with the fact that it's his fault his uncle died with great power and great responsibility. And I think it's a fundamental of the character that so many people forget that he's meant to struggle. And so much of this film is, I don't want to say relevant to me and stuff like that, because I think it's relevant to probably anyone that watches this kind of film. It's maintaining, would you say, a, a work-life balance, that sort of thing that the mm-hmm. shitty PR companies will try and say. Like, how, you know, he he's so focused on Spider-Man, he's neglecting Peter Parker, but without Peter Parker, you can't be Spider-Man. And that's the core theme of this film. And it is just done so well from direction to script and going back into the performance. But it's Raimi that's done that. You know, he's done his origin film, he's developed these characters, and now he wants to be able to play with them and develop them and change things. And Peter Parker goes through all the motions in this film. And the people around him all get development as well. That's the insane thing. It's like he just picked one and developed it. Everyone else got developed off Peter's development. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think a big part of it as well is that you know, Raimi being a Spider-Man fan, you know, growing up with the comic books, based a lot of this film off key aspects from the Spider-Man mythos. I don't know the name of the issue. I don't know the name of the cover, but the shot with the the Spider-Man suit in the trash Spider-Man can no in more. the alleyway, um, Spider-Man no more, whatever it is, um, using actual iconography from Spider-Man and sort of tethering the plot to those elements from the comic books, keeping its roots there, but still doing his own thing with it. You know, I think Dr. Octopus, I think his origin is like completely changed in this, which is absolutely fine. As long as you're maintaining a lot of those integral relationships and, you know, portrayals of the characters and um, Tobey Maguire absolutely nails it once again um, as, as Peter Parker. And what I was reading as well, we very nearly didn't get him in this one. There was a genuine possibility. Yeah, it's the that... 
Yeah, I mean, Mysterio, Mysterio was almost Peter Parker back in, in 2004, which would have been mad. I think it was like a, a back condition, which makes me just think of the my back scene from this yeah. film, which is great. Um, yeah, it was like they were genuinely like having to possibly consider recasting their lead, which would have been absolutely damning, I think, for this trilogy had it been recast. So I'm, I'm so glad that he was there for all of them. Um, he's brilliant. He, you know, exhibits loads of emotions. As you mentioned, he ha he does have to go back to kind of where it all started with Spider-Man 1 with the nerdy Peter Parker. Uh, the one thing that I have kind of mixed feelings on, I think it works for the film, but you kind of break it down and it doesn't really make much sense is that he can psychologically kind of turn off his Spider-Man powers. Like he was bitten by a spider, which completely changed his DNA, which means that, you know, he can always spin a web, he can always climb a wall. But he's kind of got like this impotence with it where he like, you know, it can just turn itself off if he's not feeling great that one day. So I don't know. I, I think it works for the film and I don't have a problem with it. And obviously it ties into his sort of like inner turmoil that he's got going on of who he wants to be. He's either got to commit himself 100 percent to Spider-Man or commit himself to 100 percent being Peter Parker. There is no middle ground. He can't be both of them. He has to dedicate his life to one thing. And that's the whole crux of the film. But what, what do you feel about that whole kind of um psychologically distancing himself from being spider-man to the point where his powers stop working do you think that works or i think it works really well only because it's been set up to work well the fact we've seen him for what the first 45 minutes would you say mm -hmm. he, he he's getting sacked from his jobs he's struggling at school he's not in the right mindset he's sort of neglecting his friends and his family and i think when you first when you build up to the you know the the putting it in the bin it's so well earned. And then they've got the harder point of how do you then have the rest of the film with him not being able to be Spider-Man again, but how do you then balance act the next part, which is him not being Spider-Man. And I think the fact that it is all about those personal struggles that he won 80s, it's to the point where he knows that Spider-Man must return. And it's, I, I never really thought it was psychological. I, I, I guess it really is when you, when you look into the mechanics of it, but I think by the time you get to the the spider sense coming back, the taxi through the window, mm -hmm. the film is done so well at managing what he's like that he's become Peter Parker so much. He's kind of not a bit of a dick, but he's more of you 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 know you need that Spider Man part of you as well for your Peter Parker to now work, and it's about the balance between the two. I think it handled it really well, mm -hmm. but again, that comes down to the the characters around him. You know, you've got. Behind the scenes, you've got Doc Ock building his lab, Harry essentially setting him up by giving his name away, Mary Jane, who clearly loves him still and is for some reason getting married, um, which we'll get into, I guess. But <laughs> is all of these little things that come together. And I think the moment the spider sense hits, and I remember that in the trailers as a kid as well, that was always in the trailer shots. Yeah. And it's such a well done scene. And then you get to that great finale with obviously the, the Doc Ock and Spider-Man and I think the film earns it and, and I think it's again that they've, they've, they've taken, that's a big risk to to, to stop being Spider-Man in your second film. Nowadays they'd be planning that would be filmed 5 out of 9 or something like that, wouldn't mm -hmm. they? So it was a very brave thing to do but I think they handled it very well but again that comes down to, to Sam Raimi personally. And you've got some beautiful scenes in there as well to kind of really showcase that turmoil that's going on as well. You've got Uncle Ben returning um, via kind of dream vision, whatever you want to say it is. Um, beautiful scene, always gets me, you know, when he says, like, take my hand and he says, no, I'm Spider-Man no more. Like the, the music as well, the music kicking in. Yeah. Um, and it really does a good job of sort of showcasing everything that's going on in his life. You know, um, he, he's worrying about Aunt May, who's got money troubles. He's got to look after her. Um, that really touching moment as well towards the beginning of the film. Um, and, you know, he's got birthday. a grandparent. They're always like that. They're always trying to give you money. And it's like, no, like, I don't need it. Like, I can get my own. And they always get really upset, don't they? Like, that is a thing, I think, with grandparents and, like, elderly people. If they offer you something, you know, take it because you'll offend them. And when she breaks down and misses Uncle Ben, so he's got all that stuff, he can't make it to, you know, um, Mary Jane's play. And you've got all that stuff. His job, as you mentioned, stuff at the Bugle um it's you see absolutely every aspect of his life it kind of breaks it all down and then when he stops being it i love how what does it say like a 75 percent rise in crime which seems very drastic but it's <laughs> it you know it does showcase that doesn't it and um the one thing as well that i, I was always kind of a little bit negative on 
um, but I can see why they did it now, and I think on reflection um, it, it works well, is that you have another set piece of another burning building, which I remember at the time thinking, oh, we're doing this again, like it, it feels very same. Yeah. But I think that's done for a reason, because you had that in the first one, and obviously Spider-Man swinging in, doing what he does best, and like, you know, being awesome at it. And then in this one, it's like, right, let's take that same concept, strip away all the powers that he has and have him just be a man. And it, I think that does, a, you know, a credit to Peter Parker as a character as well in that yeah. he doesn't just have to put the suit on to be a hero and do the right thing. He is that, you know, he is that same guy, even without the costume. He just can't do all the cool stuff that will make his job a hell of a lot easier. And there are little corny bits as well where the little girl is like, bodily picks up a yeah. fully grown man which was always weird and is still weird now but I, I don't mind it kind of repeating that beat now because I think it is it, it's trying to say something you know different even though you're taking the same set piece I guess from the first film yeah it, it's the mirror and I think with that scene once you get to the end of it because I always thought as a kid like, okay they're doing the fire scene again and it's always it's like not it didn't really become I guess they didn't do the third film but it became this thing, and when he gets in Spider Man 2, I think the, the damning bits, the aftermath, when it's like, you know, oh, poor, there was basically someone died on the floor above. And I think that's when it hits you that he knows if he was Spider Man, he would have mm-hmm. been able to save that life. And he saved one but lost another. And that's the dynamic I've always loved of it, that it wasn't enough. And the fact that he almost died trying to save the girl, it wouldn't have been enough anyway. I think it's a really no way of handling it. And it's teased it before you get, I always laugh at this scene, and I shouldn't. The guy getting battered in the street, it's like, <laughs> it's like the broadest of broad daylight. And I don't know, I've not been to New York, so I, I, you know, every well, I imagine Chicago, it's pretty like, accurate, to be honest. Well, this I, I imagine it everyone, would be like that. Everyone's had to get shot in Chicago, but in, in the main city, I, I was pretty safe away from everything. But it's like it's not even an alleyway. It's like you turn the corner, and it's happened on the corner. The man getting mm. battered, and I, I get the point of it. Like he wants to help him, but knows he can't. Now, I don't want to do that. I would have done it better than that nonsense, but. I'd have loved a scene where he'd have gone in to try and help him and got battered. It would have mm. been a bit uncomfortable, I guess. But I like leading up to the fire. Peter Parker's really conflict about he wants to do the right thing but can't bring himself to do it. I mean, obviously, the very first time is the the classic clip when he's eating the hot dog. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I was going to go there I, if you weren't going there. Yeah, yeah. yeah and they, they, they tease it so well to get to the fire, and that is the final straw that he's got to get involved in. It's just because if you'd have just ran, if you'd have took away all those scenes we just spoke about, just had a girl in the fight, I don't think they'd have earned it. I don't mm. think Peter Parker's the inner turmoil to do the right thing and become Spider Man again. And it's that bit that that I really love. And I just think it's just so well done. And it is a beautiful mirror with Spider Man One. Not that we mm. get a screaming. You know, <laughs> I was going to say, could you imagine if they put yeah, that if... footage back in and it's like comes full circle, he's still alive? <laughs> if, if Doc Ock had been in there under a cape, that'd have been a bit too much for me personally. But... <laughs> I, I love I loved what we got, but um, yeah, yeah, no, it's a good question that scene because I, I don't see a lot of people talk about it, but it's actually a really good scene, important scene mm-hmm. as well. It's it's a good sort of you know it flip flops between it so well. You know, you have the great Spider Man action, you know, throughout the film, and then when he stops being it, there's that lull in the film, but there's a lot of great character stuff going on there. The the um the Aunt May speech as well. You know, a lot of people are quite hard on like the Aunt May speeches in these films. It's like, oh, she's always got like a a lofty, wordy way of saying everything. But those are the moments that count in these yeah. films, and you don't get moments like that in superhero films now. And it always bothers me. I, it's... I don't want, I don't want my Aunt May monetizing her nephew. No, in, no, regardless exactly. of it being for charity, yeah. and like what we get now. And yeah, in in this, it's. It is almost like you're writing a conclusion to an essay about what it takes to be a hero, right? And it's, you know, she she does go on, but that's the heart and soul of it. And that's what makes these films, you know, feel so special to me, you know, in the, in the sense, same sense of like Superman the movie, where it, it makes you feel good. It, it cheers you on. You're cheering for the hero and they feel like that true superhero aspect to them. Now you get like all the flashiness and the powers and the aliens coming down and fighting them and they're all cool, but so very few of them really tap into and dissect what it is to be that character. And then, you know, when it does segue back and you've done with all the Peter Parker stuff and he's learned his lesson, he's gone through his arc, that moment where he switches, which you talk about where the taxi comes through the window, that shot, that moment is incredible. And, you know, the the blurriness with the glasses and he drops it and the theme kicks in, it it just makes that moment where he knows what he has to do, he has that clarity and we're back to Spider-Man, let's get some action in now. It just makes that point, uh, you know, all the more poignant when you get to that moment. 
Yeah, and, and I think that's what you need. And you know, we we keep speaking about it being a character piece. It's done the whole character, not to shit on modern films in, but if this was done today, and we'll be honest, not even Tom Holland, right? This will be any format. Mm. If you want him to quit, that'd be a cliffhanger for a film. And then the next film would be half of him, I'm no longer this hero, and then he'll return being the hero at the end of the next one. That's just how film was made in modern day. The fact they're able to cram almost a trilogy's worth of films into yeah. one is insane. And, and it doesn't feel rushed. It doesn't feel like they've no. bitten off more than they can chew. You know, you have that problem when they get to Spider-Man 3 for good reason, which we'll talk about next week. But yeah, it's so, it breezes by again. What is it? Is it like two hours? Two hours, a little five, over two hours ten again? maybe. It's probably a little bit it's longer not... than the first one, maybe, but um, only ever so slightly, I think. Yeah, and that's why they've got the pacing, right? And, and I think it's worth bringing up what also makes this film tick. Is is Green not Green Goblin? I was got carried away. Well, he is in the film. film. We'll talk about. Yeah, he later. is. We'll get him. To... Uh, Doctor Otto Octavius again being laughed at in the new trailers. There's a really weird conversation happening online. But loads of people are angry that they laugh at his name. Um, I wish they'd stop they... doing that now. That seems to be a yeah. thing. It's like, oh, Stephen. Oh, we're using our made up names. I'm, you know. Yeah, this oh, is... I get it. It's, like... it's comic books. Just go with it. We know, and and this is well. Like, I can't say don't mock them, but like, it's the way they were dressed. Ha ha ha! Your name's so funny. Like, that's not funny. Like we know it's a funny name, but that's not a funny joke. Where what is a is... funny joke is in this film where they yeah. do poke fun of it. Is just exactly. you know, guy, guy with it. What is it? Uh, guy named Otto Octavius winds up with eight limbs. What are the odds? Like that's that's funny. Exactly. That's great, and it's exactly. it's playfully poking fun at the source material, which is fine. Yeah, and I think it's just too easy just to have like teenagers laughing at them for no reason. Like if I was Doc Ock, I'd I'd get the looking knife, the knife dagger out right now, and just go for all three of them. <laughs> <laughs> and there's your, there's your new way home. They're not going anywhere. Um, but, oh, oh, Octavius. I don't know where to start with him. Like, I, and this is what, the performance is great. Let's even strip it down, right? We spoke last week about how we've loved these characters that, you know, the whole concept of normal is that he's insanity, he's deranged, he's going to lose the plot. Whereas this this is a scientist that's that's life's work has been miscalculated, essentially. That mm -hmm. his whole life's work doesn't doesn't everything and he can't accept it and and there's something very no about the character but even stripping it back off of that he's believable as a scientist and this is a really dumb thing to say but how many films do we watch where a man cast a scientist you know, he's not a scientist he couldn't tell you anything about science about maths whereas in this film i'm how on earth have i just drawn a blank on um his what, name, Alfred Mike. Molina. Alfred Molina. Had enough. That's embarrassing. I drew a blank on it, but he looks like a scientist. When we're introduced yeah. to him, he's in like a, a red jumper. He's having dinner with his wife. He's he's talking to uni students, and uh, the fall from grace with him is so well done. And and even when you get to the end of the film, and it's jumping way for the gun, he sacrifices himself because he knows he's done wrong, and he's that wonderful line about the uh, sort of uh, intelligence is a gift not to be wasted, mm. that kind of thing. And and this is, like, some people like shit on Tim Maguire, so that spy map, like, ah, he's not a scientist, he's going to make his own webs. This man tells Dr. Octopus he's miscalculated before he's even done it. <laughs> and we get to see him doing science things, having nerdy science discussions and all that kind of stuff. And it's a really interesting character because you kind of know his wife's going to die. I mean, as, as a kid, obviously you went in at the age of eight, but... You know, a main villain having a loving wife and his introductory yeah. scene, you know how that's going to end and you know, we spoke yesterday about the, um, the scene itself but <laughs> just in terms of Doc Ock, just, this is, we haven't even got to the arms but just the actual he's believable and this is where the Spider-Man trilogy it goes down to casting again right bar maybe Toad for Grace who I think is believable in some parts what he does just not being Venom mm -hmm. they nailed everything from the get-go yeah. anything you need us to know about them you could take one look at them and bit okay, I see that, and I see why that, and it reaches a point in this trilogy where it's basically like unrecastable, which is why we're getting them all now in twenty. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, I was I was going to say, you know, almost twenty years on, and we haven't had another Doctor Octopus. I know there's the one in Into the Spider Verse, but live action wise, we haven't had one. They they can't do it. Like you know, and even when you play the PS4 game, you're, you're obviously met with memories of Alfred Molina, even when you play the PS4 game because it's so similar. Uh, I was having a look at some of the other actors that were considered for the part of Dr. Octopus. You had um, Ed Harris, Chris Cooper, Christopher Walken. 
and uh, and Robert De Niro. I think out of all of those, Robert De Niro would be the closest one. But Alfred Molina, <laughs> you could not wish for a better casting yeah. than Alfred Molina. He is the character. He looks like the character. That's one of the, they nailed the casting across all of these films. Even um, Sandman, um, Flint Marco's yeah. character in the next one, straight off the comic book page. They nailed the look. They nailed the performance. And uh, Molina was actually a fan of Marvel Comics, but he was unfamiliar with the character of Dr. Octopus. So it was kind of going in cold for him. But he must have done his research because apparently the one thing that he loved was the like the cruel sense of humor that Dr. Octopus had. And there are some pretty cheesy one liners in there that goes throughout all of the Raimi films. Um, but that's what I love about them. It knows exactly what it's adapting and knows what it needs to be. He is just tremendous, like from from the Otto Octavius at the beginning of the film, uh, where we see, you know, his happy life. And I actually want to say, I don't know the name of the actress who plays um, Rosie, but we only get like, is it one proper scene with him and Rosie? But they have such good chemistry together. Yeah. You believe they could be like a married couple that have been together for years and years when they're, you know, given anecdotes about how they first met each other. It's great. Uh, the arms we'll absolutely talk about in a minute because the look of these things is, is still incredible. The sound and everything about them. And I think he nicknamed them all. Uh, yeah, on here. So he called them Larry, Harry, Mo, and Flo. He, he, uh, Alfred Molina kind of nicknamed each one of the arms based on like the, the puppeteers, I think. Um, it's just absolutely tremendous. And I, I actually kind of like, and I don't know if this is in the comic books, it probably isn't. But like the split personality, kind of Gollum Smeagol yeah. kind of aspect to it, where the arms are actually physically talking and manipulating his brainwaves and everything, and he's having full on conversations with them. I, I'm assuming that that's not in the comic books. I'm assuming it's just you know he gets these arms and then he starts being like this mad scientist throwing cars around and everything. But it's such a unique angle to the character. You've got the Elfman score that kind of makes it really creepy as well. Uh, I, I thought that was an inspired choice, and I guess it, it kind of gives um you know alfred molina's character something to work with he's having this sort of like monologue these these conversations with himself because if he didn't have that what would he do he'd just be like standing in silence working on his doomsday machine this energy reactor thing but it, it kind of gives him something to interact with and the way he switches between the kind of innocent and assuming otto octavius especially at the beginning when he's like oh but we need money it's like steal it no i'm not a criminal and then he's he, he switches to like Dr. Octopus. Perfect acting, perfect casting, and you do genuinely feel sorry for him. Um, and he, it's just the look of the character's cool. I, I do, you know, Spider Man has one of the best rogue galleries. I think he has the best rogue gallery out of any Marvel character. Not quite up to yeah. Batman's standard, you know, Batman's level, but certainly for Marvel for me, his rogue gallery is incredible. But just to see Dr. Octopus perfectly realized on screen and practically as well, you know, we'll talk about like the arms in a second, but. The fact that Raimi was like, I want to do as much of this in camera as possible, which I absolutely commend him for. They didn't need to. They could have CGI'd it all, but they use CGI sparingly when they absolutely need to for the crazy elaborate stunts in like the action scenes where they're falling off towers and whatnot. But in the close-ups, that you know, they built that from scratch, and it it's you know testament to it now. I don't know if they've done that for the new film from the trailer. It looks like they are all CGI. It's easier to do it. I get it, but. It's just so cool. And the behind the scenes as well. To see Alfred Molina stood in front of a green screen singing, if I was a rich man from Fiddler on the yeah. Roof with these with these like arms on a string, it's yeah, it's just great stuff. I, I think you mentioned there that you know it looked so great because it was real. And I think because they knew they were making puppets, they didn't go overboard on what those designs would be. And you think that even in in, in universe, they they've got to be practical. Like there were designs to look after the sun. I guess as a main thing, uh, mm. technically, and you know it's got to be not over the top and not not. I mean, I, I don't mind the new trailer, but that we're getting like the nanotech on the arms in the new trailer. Like he absorbs the technology, and they're all big and they're a bit red, and I don't mind that. But the original ones look so great the way they were, and it's because they knew they couldn't. They were going to do it as puppet stuff, and any behind the scenes from this. You get the one where Willem Dafoe turned up on set that day as well when he did the speech mm -hmm. and was was doing all the stuff and it's obviously like it seems like they have a lot of fun and that's what I've got about Molina you know, like he he has a lot of respect for the franchise and you know when they were casting people last year I was not surprised that he was one of the first names back I think he'd openly said in the past he'd be happy to play the character again that he had an affection for it and it's really interesting going to see what they do with him because you you mentioned the scenes of Rosie as well they've been together since they were younger and. 
is it the inner turmoil or everything that them talking to him is a great little concept because you kind of need it to explain to the audience why he's suddenly gonna you know be evil because you know you get that scene the, the horror scene where they're killing everything which is mm-hmm. undeniably one of the standout scenes of the film in, it's in the, the nails way. on the floor that's the yeah, that's what always it me. still gets me i don't know if it's the, still the correct terms goosebumps but like when they drag and as a kid i didn't like and it's not the sound it's it's just like the texture which does it and it's just as a kid that was a horrifying scene you get like and then obviously it ends with that one guy when all four of them just come i don't know if they've had the sticker book but i this i remember getting this sticker in the sticker book and it was the shot of the forearms scattered around right yeah and it was just before they all go and go in the kill on that bloke who probably gets ripped apart but mm-hmm. The fact that like Otto's walking around like Frankenstein's monster, he, he's not aware of where he is, he's not aware of his surroundings, but these arms are just throwing cars around. And everyone shits so on the Vader no from Revenge of the Sith, but this film did it first, a year early. Hey, and, and the no, arms scream. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fine. It's great. The arms are whale. Like, they're moving with him like that. It, it, it's amazing, and I just love what they did of it. And The thing is, the arms have personality, and that sounds really dumb, but cause we know they're ultimately controlling him, but when, obviously, uh, aren't they clacks around the edge. So later on in the film, saying, sorry, it's not going to work again because they've realised it and it's like that thing that it's not training his audience as dumb people and, and neither the character that, you know, he, at the end of the day, he's a scientist and he's on the verge of, of, of greatness, no doubt about it, but it, it never worked out for him, I guess. And, you know, his life's work's almost destroyed a city, it's killed his wife and it's the sad fact that he can't acknowledge that there was a miscalculation. And uh, it's all he has left as well, you know. Everything else is gone. It's like, exactly. what what can he do now with the, with these grafted to him? Like he, he's got to throw himself into his work, like no matter what, no matter the cost, he's devoted his life to it, and that's all he's got. Uh, the arms as well, I wanted to mention. Do all of them have like the unique attachments? You've got the one that's got like the more precise kind of grabby thing that like takes his glasses off. You've got the, the, one that's one. Got the knife out of it. You've got the one that um oh god there's another one as well I, I thought they all had like the one with the um yeah the knife the the grabby thing and I thought they all had different things I, I don't know if that's a thing they probably do they, they they could probably make it like um I was costume at Suicide Squad where like and it could do anything and th- what made me not laugh nanotechnology has obviously been like a Marvel term since Black Panther but in this it's like using like nano technology wise yeah nano wise yeah. that's it and it goes well because like oh my god like. Not, not that Nano was created by Marvel, but it, it's like passing comments out now where it's like, this is actually really cool and quite like I'm not saying this is like Nolan and so I'm not saying there's science behind it, but the logic of the science that he wants to create new energy by creating a miniature version of the sun and that he's got all these devices with him. And they're like the ultimate, I guess, like Swiss Army knife, just mm. 24 7 service. And they're just their design so great. And when you get the action scenes, they, they, give them so much freedom and that they all do different things. They're not just there to walk him around. Like you do get that, but the arms are actually more functional than I think they've got any right to be. Mm-hmm. I think that says it as well. The fact we're talking about the functionality of, of, of four fictional arms on a fictional character, but it's things like that, that just create environments and create characters and build those legacies. Mm-hmm. And I think this film was nominated for like, sound, was it sound editing, sound mixing, whatever, whatever the two categories were back in the day. Um, and I think that was justified as well because the arms sound heavy. They sound imposing. Yeah. The sound that goes into them, I think they did it with like a bike chain and like piano wire or something. But when those are like slamming into the ground when he's walking, like they're they're heavy. Like yeah. they feel imposing when they're flipping cars and whatnot. You know, even when it is a CGI creation in some of the action scenes, the sound really gives it that weight to it. So it's not like you're just watching weightless CGI characters do something. There's impact on the environments when they fall onto that train there's you know the the ceiling dents and everything the the, um, the glass in the window smash there's an impact there there's a weight behind it which i really appreciate um i will say it is funny like you know him being a scientist the one thing that prevents these arms from taking over is like i've developed a really really small inhibitor chip on the back of my head that is easily destroyable with like the the smallest burst of electricity and it's gone yeah, it, it works. You know they acknowledge it, and it, it it is set up as to why they take over. But I'm like, you couldn't have made that chip like 
a little bit bigger or or made it like you know short circuit proof but you know that it's a small gripe i'm, I'm absolutely fine with it honestly like, i i can't nick pick this film i really can't because it, it just works for it um i think we said i mean we could probably say a hell of a lot more on doc ock in all honestly like every single line that he has everything with him but maybe we should move on to some of the other characters now so i know a big one that we always talk about as well and this is going to be a big talking point next week i'm sure in spider-man 3 harry osborne um you know not only do they continue the stories of you know toby Maguire, peter parker um and introduce doc ock and give him a fulfilling story as well harry osborne as well and i'm actually really glad that they didn't make him the goblin in this film yeah uh to this film's credit the fact that it is you know one villain one villain solely and you think of like many superhero sequels as well not all of them you know there are still some that just devote it to one villain but a lot of ones that i'm trying to think of you know um uh batman returns you've got catwoman and penguin you've got when you get to a sequel, a lot of the times they'll throw multiple villains in. It, it's that escalation. It's a let's, you know, cram more in if we can. I was going to say Batman Begins, but that technically had two as well. But, you know, Dark Knight, you've got Two Face and Joker in there. This one was like, no, let's just focus on Dark Ark, and that really works well. But in the sidelines, you're setting up Harry Osborne and you continue, him, you know, continuing the story in such a great way, building on from the first one where we saw Spider Man place, you know, the body of his dead father down. He's just got revenge on the brain. But that beautiful sort of like, you know, that divide again where he, you know, his best friend, Pete Parker. And we see some tensions there as well when he's drunk at the party and he's slapping him in the face, which always makes me laugh. Um, yeah. But it's setting up that Green Goblin stuff in the background so well. And then, you know, when you get to that final scene, I was watching it again thinking it's weird that he sees a vision of his father because... The, the weird visions and psychological breakdown and everything of Norman that only really happened after he took the serum. And this kind of happens before Harry has the serum. I think that's one of the first scenes that we see of him in Spider-Man three is where he walks out of the tank with all of the green gas, but yeah. this is before that. So he hasn't been subject to anything like that. So you could argue that it's a bit weird that he's seeing visions of his dad and he's kind of talking to himself in the same way that Norman Osborn did, but it works so well for that lead up for that setup into Spider-Man three. And I, and I like you, I remember seeing that final scene and getting really hyped. Like we're going to get green goblin in the next one. It's going to be awesome. That's our big villain for the next one. And then we, we, we know what happened with the villains in Spider-Man three, which is a conversation for next week. Yeah. The, the Harry Osborn stuff's great. So I think that's because Spike saying it never really clicked with me that, I mean, we knew that he'd been a terrible father, but the, it was the final meeting of them was the repairing of the son and the father friend relationship. And having that, I mean, you know, this one's funny, but we, when you've seen the film for 17 years, you know, you know, from the get go, you know, still taking pictures of Spider Man, like you sent it to his birthday. It's like, you're not answering my calls. It's like, okay, that, you know, at the end of the day, you don't know it. But now it's like, okay, setting up things is cool. There's going to be a subplot. And you don't realize how involved Harry really is. And at the same time, he might be pissed off, but he's still being his mate. He's still, you know, talk about like big big corporate stuff. You know, making Octavius like meet his best mate for research yeah. for uni. <laughs> I thought that was great. The way like Octavius like I've, I've not got time for this, and Harold's one's like you do. And you know that's how it does work these days. Mm -hmm. And I love that kind of stuff that he starts off so arrogant. He's the head of Oscorp. He's inherited the the company. I guess it makes sense because all the other executives are killed, right? And it's going to, you know, put, it's that sort of, you know, when the old guy says to him, this Oscorp, Oscorp's going to go on the map like never before. And you can tell it means so much to him. It is that smug businessman thing. Like the it's like Nobel Prize, Otto, Nobel Prize. Yeah, yeah, and he's so good at the cocky stuff. And that's when you get the fact that the the, the it failed. Not only do you get the fantastic quote. <laughs> uh, yes, it's one of the best. I've got nothing left except Spider-Man. It's like, it's like, and it's like he what, humiliated he me by touching me. And yeah, puts his shades on and gets like escorted into a limo or something, doesn't he? Yeah, and it's it's that ridiculous bad guy. And by the time you get to the party scene, that state of mind is earned. That he's clearly bet everything he has on on Octavius and is backfired. And it's and it, you know I was sort of watching it and I was like, yeah, like he's right that you know this is his so called best friend. And he's protect. I mean, we know it's Spider Man, obviously, but the logic, the logic of Harry Osborne's correct that this is the guy that killed his father, and your best friend takes his photos. How would you react if your best friend won't do anything about it? And it, it's such a great way to really tense their relationship as best friends because you see the friendship in them, 
that you know it's deteriorating and you know it's going to get the real. Now, talk about spoilers and trailers these days. Yeah. Do you remember the, the trailer as a kid? Now, I do. To me, that wasn't a spoiler because I just, you know, it was going to happen that the concept of spoilers wasn't there. But I loved the reaction to that whole scene. And also, like, has he got like barbed wire on as well? That's what I was. Yeah, like, he's like wrapped. Yeah, I know. He's wrapped too. in barbed wire and just rips it off. And <laughs> I love the fact that Harry's caused everything by giving him the tritium and he's connected to all of it. But Harry's relationship with Peter's great. And, and going back to this about the, the, the Norman cameo, I never thought of like that. I was just so excited about the fact that Willem Dafoe is back on screen. So oh, no, it's great. I, I love it. I love it. But then I was maybe, kind maybe of, you know, haunting. my over-analytical brain, I was like, well, no, like, why, I is he, would, like, why is he tripping at this point? You know? It's, it's, it's probably, I, I'm guessing it's his inner thoughts. Yeah. Maybe or something. But just the, the reveal of that whole scene, like, you wouldn't know it's coming. You know, if he'd have gone to the Oscorp factory and, like, you know, gone for a tour and found a locked bedroom or something where it'd be, that would make sense in Discovery, but the fact it's just uh, Shattering a Mirror is a very common film thing, but the fact that it's the secret passageway, the lights come on as well, they've got all the pumpkin bombs and the theme kicking in, it's such mm. a fantastic scene, and oh, Spider-Man 3 next week, yeah. So much potential. We're going to use potential so much as, as a word next week, but and we hope it lives Harry's to stories. It. Yeah. yeah, and I think you know, as far as the trilogy goes, Harry's probably the, the most developed character after Peter Parker. And I think when he gets to his end game next week, I, I think he's actually earned the status. No matter what, what disappointing things happen in that film, I think Harry's arc is is still pretty damn good, most ninety percent of it. I was going to say it, it. It's a shaky road throughout Spider-Man Three with the whole Harry Osborn thing, but I think it sticks the landing and it, and it does yeah. what it sets out to do, and it is fulfilling towards the end of the film. Um, I, I'm glad you mentioned the trailer shot as well because I'll never forget that. It's it's where he, he draws the knife and he's approaching him on the bed. I'll never forget that. That was yeah. like I, I don't think they did they show him like whipping the mask off in the trailer or was it just him with the knife? I, I remember him showing the knife and Spider-Man being tied up. And yeah, I, think I remember. He the head. I think as he grabs the head, it would cut. Oh, okay. And I, I think I, I might double check, but I remember it being like that. It's a great reaction, though. Like when he just kind of stumbles back and like drops the knife out of his hand. Like it's it's a really believable reaction to it. And then that kind of awkward alliance that they, they're kind of forced into at the end of that film. The one bit that I do think is very far fetched. It's like a Batman moment. It's where um, I think it's right before it, it's it's where Doc Ock gets the tritium. He's like, "I've bought you Spider Man. Now give me the tritium." And he opens the safe for him, and he takes it. And then it cuts to Harry Osborn, I think, like preparing to approach Spider-Man. And then he turns around and he's like, oh, Dr. Octopus is gone. And he's like, oh, yeah, he's like fucked up. He's not Batman. He's not a ninja. Those arms are heavy. He's loud. He's yeah. not silently moving. He's immense. So I don't know how he managed to sneak out of there so quickly. Like it, It's functional for the scene. But I was noticing these little bits like, oh, that's, you know, you would have heard clunk, clunk, clunk of these arms walking <laughs> out of the room. But it's fine. I get it. It's fine. Uh, let's talk about MJ then. Um <laughs> oh this is complicated no i, I think it, she works in this film my problems really yeah. don't start a mountain until spider-man 3 Man and then 3. there's a lot of problems but my god she's flighty she gets about doesn't she in these films like she's never quite satisfied with whoever she's with uh she's like moved from pillar to post in this one even to the point where she's like marrying this guy and uh we're meant to hate this guy engaged for like a week yeah, I know it's and, and she's clearly only doing it to kind of get one over on Peter and kind of stand her ground and she clearly doesn't love this guy. You know, there's the bit where she um upside down kisses him on the couch and she's like, Yeah, it's not quite it's not quite hitting the spark that Peter Parker did all those years ago. Um it's frustrating because she does become another damsel in distress at the end of the film. And I think as each film progresses it kind of compounds on itself a little bit more, especially in Spider-Man 3 where Venom's got her in the taxi. I thought, oh, and you, you're hearing a scream for like the millionth time. I was like, we're still doing this three films in. This one, it works, but it does feel a bit tacked on like, oh yeah, you know, I need to get rid of Spider-Man and you're going to be the thing that he's going to come after. So it works for this film again, but it is starting to creep in where I'm like, I'm kind of done with this whole damsel in distress thing with Mary Jane. But then besides that, it's like, what do you do with her? And, you know, she is yeah. there to serve as that, you know, she is the love of Peter's life. It is that romantic crux of the story, which is very integral to Spider-Man. I will say that. And that should absolutely be there. 
it's just she gets very unlikable for me as the films go on and i, I just find a down, downright intolerable in spider-man 3 i just find a really mean-spirited come spider-man 3 yeah. but she's not bad in this film i still think she's played very well but as the films go on you do get the sense of it's like uh, we kind of don't know what to do with mary jane's character yeah i think for this one it's only for the purpose of finding out he's spider-man which i think is the definitely the mm-hmm. best thing they did was do it in this film yeah i think yeah. because you built up this relationship where she clearly loves him shit the coffee shop for god's sake about to to kiss him in public and and all this stuff and yeah i always loved the the theater scenes yeah and i don't know too. why I, I don't know if it's like the terminology like they're trying to do like a posh play but the empty chair and, and then obviously the fact that we've obviously got him uh, coming in later on and he like knows the words he's happy and I, I'm I'm in on their relationship, like it's working, and I think kidnapping her is a bit OTT from Doctor Octopus, especially when Harry's like, you know, don't don't touch Peter, um, and you know he just kidnaps the other one instead, mm. and it gets really nasty again. He's like, I'll peel the flesh from her bones. Like this bit, <laughs> oh, look, yeah, yeah we've, bit. <laughs> we've had like Green Goblin in the first film, you know, talking about the hell of a time, yeah, get the hell of a time. Him. <laughs> and this one is like okay, like we know that that's the trigger gate that anyone that says anything about MJ, he will turn into. Oh, Venom wants in, to get into... with her as well, doesn't he? He's like, yeah. my spidey sense is tingling. If you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> they all have yeah, a for MJ. It's it's the one thing that that gets him aggravated every time, and you know, may, maybe no way home if he does come into it. I'd be a shame if that portal opened up and they've already kidnapped her, which is why like Tim McGuire's there. I don't hope we get that, but I wouldn't <laughs> be surprised. Um, no, it's she's a trick one. I, I think I'm down on it because their romance needs to, to get to that next level. It's kind of then what do you do in Spider-Man 3? And I think that's where Spider-Man 3 went wrong mm. was the dealing with the, they've been together for X amount of years. Now you've got to cope with this. I think they get a lot of that wrong, but this one they build up to the natural place of where it's going to end. And it also gave birth to one of the, the greatest ever memes of the scream. <laughs> Oh, and God. the bit that the bit yeah. that no one ever talks about is the giant rolling metal cage mm-hmm. that like no one ever cares about until it's like a second. And only because I played the new Spider-Man game so much the last few years, I was wondering like, how the hell did you web up on a canal? Mm-hmm. And I don't really ask those yeah. kind of questions normally. But like, now I've played that Spider-Man game and that has physics, which is incredible. That it's on that game. I'm always like, how did you just like do that? But I, I don't care. I'm sold on it. But no, MJ in this one, the one that I always laugh at as well is the um. The birthday party at the start, where like Harry Drake's boyfriend, but even Harry knows he he she was in love with Peter. Like the the fact they never cared it was her ex, I think is quite amazing until Spider Man Three. Then again, they handle it quite wrong. Yeah, it gets very. I mean, that's a conversation for next week. But the love triangle stuff does really dampen Spider Man Three a lot. They put way too much focus on it. I just feel so bad for John Jameson. In, in in this whole situation like we're meant to not like him because he's just uh, he doesn't get many lines in the film but he comes across as like this you know brash kind of bravado machismo kind of guy but he's not inherently a bad guy you know he falls in love with mary jane he you know proposes to her so there's clearly a connection there even though i mean these must have been seeing each other for quite a while if he popped the question that quickly um and then he gets stood up it's like the, the graduate at the end of the movie just you know she runs off and then even by the end of the film, you think, oh, she's finally with Peter Parker. Everything's happy. You get the amazing swing way again. Not quite as amazing as Spider-Man 1, but it's still cool. And I always thought that the film ended on that like distant shot with him swinging with the helicopters. But then the final shot of the film is that really kind of bittersweet undertone where it, it zooms back in on Mary Jane. She kind of looks a little bit miffed, like, oh, there's going to be some tension's yeah. going to come back in. The score kind of goes a bit dour towards the end before we fade into the credits. And it's like, oh my god, woman, you're finally with Peter Parker. You know who he is. You literally seconds ago said you were cool going through all his trials and tribulations. You want to be there for him. And then when he swings off, she's like, oh yeah, maybe this isn't the life for me. I- I've always interpreted that way. I don't know how you interpret it, but um, yeah. N- n- never in that way. I always kind of thought it was just, uh, oh, she's kind of happy, but also knows that he's he's off, but... You do get the great line, Go Game Tiger, which is yeah. um, the classic MJ line, which doesn't get said yeah. a lot anymore. But yeah, the, the MJ stuff, I think it is more Spider Man 3 sort of uh, just handles it wrong. And that's why, if we're going to get them in No Way Home, brackets, Kirsten Dunst was the. Was Kirsten Dunst and Jamie Foxx the first two casts? Which was I the think two so. Weird. Yeah, she was one of the. And, yeah. I, and I think it was so early, everyone was like, this can't be true. Why would they cast MJ and Electro? And it's only when the big hits came at Alvin Molina, it's like, okay, that's something. Um, but 
yeah, the, the triangle is it's not irking as much, and she doesn't get many scenes with other people. But John Jameson, I mean, we'll, we'll get to his dad in a bit. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's another classic Marvel character they teed up. That, yes, I think, was it Wolfman, yeah. and we, we we'll probably speak. But I think me and you spoke in the past saying like you know deep down we know Raimi didn't want to do Venom, but let's say Sam Raimi wanted to have done Venom right in Spider Man Three. It'd have had John Jameson bring the symbol to Earth. Yeah, he, he would have done. It would have been as simple as that, and and it goes down to again, Aviar is sticking his nose in where it doesn't belong. Well, I, I don't know why he didn't do that, do that though, because he did have the character and he could have used him. You know, just going up in a have exactly. your opening scene be him go up in space in a rocket. I I don't know if it is necessarily solely John Jameson who just goes up into space and then it latches onto the rocket. I, I don't really know the history of the character, but I know he has something to do with it. You have it that character, and he never comes back. In, yeah, he just it... shows up out of nowhere because we need Venom in the story. Literally shows up out of thin air. And I don't know, I feel like you just needed one scene where it feels so weird to set up John Jameson as a character in this one and never comes back. Never any kind of payoff or any kind of revenge or whatnot. You could have thrown that in there maybe where if he is aware that he brought the symbiote down, maybe he doesn't care because she's off with Peter Parker and he wants to get revenge. That would have probably clashed with Eddie Brock Jr. though because you do a lot of similar things in that revenge kind of subplot with him. But yeah, I guess that's more of a conversation for three, but it's just, there's a good setup here for a character, even yeah. if it's a bit part character return and it's, it's it's just weird that they never did anything with him. No, I think that exactly. It, it just feels a bit, not wasted, but it, it's just something missing when you look back at it as a trilogy, which we're doing. It is that awkward, you know, my son, the astronaut, and, and that's as much <laughs> character development as he's going to get. Um that's one Let's... of my favorite lines. That, that's one of my favorite moments, probably from the film. That line. <laughs> we're, we're almost there. We're almost there. We've got to talk about Art May before we get to the Daily Bugle. Yeah. Um, I mean, we spoke a bit about Art May with the speeches Rosemary Harris, but what an absolute treasure she is in this film mm-hmm. again. We get to see her in action for the first time. I know that the Spider Verse got proper action scenes, but Rosemary Harris going one on one with Doc Ock on the side of a New York building is <laughs> special. It, she's just honestly she she brings such a calming presence to the film and the fact she's you know you spoke last week about the fact that uncle ben's struggling in the modern world he can't find a job it's all computers and it's a different generation mm-hmm. the fact that aunt may struggling I mean, it's not like it's dreams pay a bill that's her mortgage that's like you know a, a, not a small thing and looking at it now it, it's quite troubling that i not that i would need to actually have had a job or not but certainly not secret agent aren't they but it's one of them where you just kind of you get these like things. It's just again, it's the life lessons, isn't it? It's what Peter Parker's characters are going through. He has his financial turmoil, as does his aunt. But his aunt just wants to give him a, a, a present, which gets nicked by another great character we'll be speaking about soon. But it's just one of them where she she brings a presence to this film. And I think you are right for the speeches. It's you know, like Captain America in Endgame. Like anytime anyone needs a speech, he's your guy. It's kind of what she does. Yeah, no, and that speech is amazing. Uh, I, I did want to ask you the question: Do you think she knows that Peter Parker is Spider Man in that moment? I, I have always thought so that she just knew, and I think I, I the way I always interpreted as her saying, "What do you mean we did it?" She tried to pretend she didn't hit him, but there's a part of me watching this trilogy, certainly the scene at the house with the little neighbor. Yeah, that's the. That's I the think bit she I'm knows. Yeah. I think I yeah. Sorry, that bit she knows. I, I I'm just convinced that she knows. And I know the Spider Man game did that. Uh, I'm not going to spoil the game for anyone not played it. But um, oh, no. yeah, oh, they boy. they handled yeah. it so well. And I I don't want to be morbid and say it's a shame we never got to get that done in the the Raimi verse. But mm. had we have had the six film saga as originally promised, oh, yeah, I yeah. I think we would have had her formally knowing the reveal mm. of him as Spider-Man at some point or another. And I just think she brings such a, a calming presence to it. But I, mm. I love her scenes. And even with the little... We, we spoke um, uh, we spoke about characters and Ghostbusters. And the little kid neighbor, he's got one scene. He's a New York, proper New York Queens accent. Mm-hmm. But I like that whole dynamic as well. The, you know, it's just, it's just a kid helping and they want to start talking about Spider-Man. And it's almost the way she opens her mouth feels like a monologue from the opening word. That you know you're in for a life lesson now. It's like the tone has shifted, and the folks will shift with it. And it's like I, Alfred I just... in the Nolan trilogy, isn't it? It's like every yeah, time Alfred is, yeah. speaks, you're going to get something. Yeah. And I, and I, and I think she's just so welcome. And I think with Rosemary Harris's Aunt May, because she's so wholesome, 
that's reflected on how Toby McGuire's I, I guess the her best scene from the film is the the revelation about uh, you mm-hmm. know what happened when my like, uncle Ben died, and I don't know why, but for some reason I always thought he got slapped. And I don't know if it's been on a remake online. So like when and I know it doesn't happen, but whenever I watch the scene, I always expect him to get slapped at the end of it, but he never mm-hmm. does. It's such a great scene. It would have ended with a very different tone between those yeah. two characters. Yeah. No, no, um, it's, it's, that it's, scene's it's immense, way, though. Yeah. It's a heartbreaking well. scene. Like you, mm. you can see the pain in it, but it's the shot. It, it's the, the hand pulling away and just mm. going upstairs to bed. And it's what we spoke about last week. They don't linger. One shot, long take, corner of the room. Ah, oh, it's just, it's a great scene. I needed him to like go into more depth though, like he says, like I was in I was in a cage match for three minutes with <laughs> Macho Man I'm Randy Saul Savage. McGraw. <laughs> with both <Paul> Saul McGraw. <laughs> oh, if only she knew, if only she knew everything that transpired during that wrestling match. Um and it's moments like that, you know, he's talking about that, and I, I just keep getting flashbacks of that scene from Spider-Man one where it's just it's just yeah, you know, oh my legs, the flying Dutchman. Um, no, it, it's such a great scene though, and yeah, she plays it brilliantly. I'm glad they didn't adapt that story from the comic where um, doesn't like Doctor Octopus marry Aunt May yes, in the comic there's books? There's a very like... weird to get close <sighs> I mean, as the family. I mean, was the that in the books... animated show as well? Was he dating her in the animated show? I can't remember. I, can't, I know it's in the comic books. I, I remember seeing the panel where he's at yeah. the altar and he's getting married. Jesus getting married Christ! Her. Yeah, the comic books do some weird shit. Cocaine is a hell of a drug, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but. Yeah, no, the bit where he likes it's it's like we must protect Aunt May at all costs. She she is everyone's grandma. It's like, you know, and, and the bit where um Spider-Man saves her and he's like that plucky attitude, which is great. It's kind of like the Superman thing, like we sure showed him, and it's just like, yeah, Aunt May, you're brilliant. And and that speech is I mean, I can't say enough positive things about the speech. That is you want the antithesis of what a superhero should be, boom. There you go. You know, take take that to the bank. And speaking of the bank, I didn't intend that as a segue. Is it Joel McHale? Joel McHale from Community. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. We talk about side characters in this film. This this film's got it in spades. <laughs> <laughs> the, the like really sleazy, cowardly yeah. manager, the bank manager, the bank clerk, whatever it's... it is, is like, oh, ow, when he gets like kicked under the table <laughs> and slapped on the hand. It's like the same sound bite every time. I, I think the the big one for me was when when I got my first job in retail, like everyone did. Uh, the first ever time there was a declined coupon. <laughs> and it was it's like, it's like uh, I, with the first half and I just thought of Spider-Man 2 and I always think of it now like just declining someone's coupon it's like actually you know, yeah and it's it's so well done and again it is it needed no but it's such a great line of humour that it's got a place for it because it just fits what's going on and even to the point later when he like goes to steal one of the coins and she like slaps his hand it's just he's just he's great, and I think mean, that's one of the, he's one of those actors, isn't it? When you you watch something they're famous for, and then you you find them in in something mm-hmm. they did way before, which is such a minor role. But yeah, John McHale in Spider Man Two is the bank manager, just and the bank scene itself is just a great scene as well. But the way just Peter just charges out and it's like that's 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 a great kid of yours, mm-hmm. and it's just oh, I, I I absolutely love it. Oh, so many great side characters. Now I'm looking at the plan here. And we've got the, the one and only. But do we want to talk about Rent first? Do we want to talk about Mr. Yeah, and his family yeah, and let's... then save the, the Bugle till last? Yeah, yeah. Let, let's go Miss Dikovic. Um, I'm going to ask you quickly. Did you realise, I'm going to say five years ago, how funny he truly was until the last <laughs> two years? Because I had no idea other people found him as funny as I do. It, it seems like it's one of those moments where every time I watch the film, I either notice something or I have a new appreciation for it. It kind of builds every single time I watch it. I did always find him funny as a kid. And it, it was mostly just like the rent thing and like the expressions like, what is this like in the eyes? Like a rodent. And he does that. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> uh, So I always found that funny. He was just such a weird character. I remember when that door flung open when I was watching the DVD. And that music's playing, like the the weird kind of like Russian polka music's playing. I just thought, what is this? <laughs> who, who is this? This dysfunctional family? Who is this guy? But it is one of those things that I just get more and more appreciation for. Definitely, uh, I did always find him amusing, but it, it is something that's definitely built over the years. Even little moments now, which obviously I've seen the film loads of times. I know it like the back of my hand, but 
just laughing at moments that I've never laughed at that hard before. The bit where um, right after his introduction scene where it cuts to Tobey Maguire and he's like getting ready to go in the bathroom and he just kind of sleepily, you know, Mr. Dickovich sleepily walks past him, just opens the door and shuts it behind him and gets in the bathroom first. Pause. Rent. Like just little moments <laughs> like that. It's it's amazing. And I think I think he's one of the consistent characters across Spider-Man 2 and 3 as well. I always get a kick out of seeing it. And now he's one of those actors where he is Mr. Dickovich to me. So when he yeah. shows up in Transformers Dark of the Moon, I'm like, that's Mr. Dickovich. When I when I watch Austin Powers for the review and I'm like, that unspeaking extra, that's Mr. Dickovich. And it's, yeah, it, it's amazing. And I've got high hopes for No Way Home. I kind of want everyone from the Raimi trilogy. I would just like throw everything but the kitchen sink into the film. Um, but he is such a joy in these films. Um, definitely one of the highlights for me. Yeah. And I think it's been sort of the, the meme era, the sort of, what do we call it last week? It was like post Spider-Verse slash Spider-Man PS4 game. Like they've escalated to a new level. I think the, the Raimi films, but when the No Way Home trailer was coming up, I was seeing people I follow on Twitter. Who I've never seen tweet about Spider-Man and they're all tweeting like the rent gifts and everything. And, and I'm just there, like, what on earth? Like, this exists beyond the the actual Spider-Man fans that do do all the meme the meme shit posting and stuff. And it just it adds so much. And it, it's looking at it again as you get a bit older when you realize the struggles Peter Parker's going through. And it's, you know, I've only got this twenty dollar bill to the end of the week, and he's already grabbed it by the time he's gone. And again, it's it's Sam Raimi knows how to create, and he's not creating too many additional characters. But it's just that environment that you know that Peter Parker is going to have this environment where he's going to have a landlord. How do you show he's struggling with money? You have a visible landlord. But you don't want to be a creep that's a suit. You want him to be funny, be a bit different. And and that is an understatement of, of whatever year it is to, to that. How on earth a character like Mr. Dickovich <laughs> became an icon, we'll never know. Um, it, it's it's something, that, you know, one day, if you, let's say you ever got to meet him, you'd be like, so... Where are all the deleted scenes? Like, what else? Like, how how do the scenes work? Is it improv? Is it script? Because I just want to know. And it's you mentioned earlier, it's like, even his daughter Ursula, who's you know she's anorexic, and is it in this one? Next one when he says, you know, if, if no, it's this one. If, if promises was, were crackers, my daughter would be fat. Would be fat. <laughs> and it's like it's so funny, and it, it's kind of wrong, but it, it, it's it's how awkward Ursula. Like, and I love I love Ursula. I, I, I think she's really underrated. We'll speak about favorite scenes later, but. The way like she like flings it and sets on fire and the door shuts and the music stops. It is just they they added a dimension. The fact we get it in Spider Man three as well. And barely um, like, you know, there's not loads of screen time. There's not an excessive amount, but they leave such an impact, you know, these great character yeah. actors. I love Ursula. She's so wholesome. Like, we must protect Aunt May and Ursula. They're the two people we must protect. I've seen people in mean groups saying like She's she like the her. ultimate woman for Peter. Like she, she was the one. She was the one that got away. Uh, she's way more likable than Mary Jane, and maybe they're right. I don't know. Um, I love all those characters. I was going to mention another character as well, uh, Bruce Campbell. I'm going to save him for my favorite scenes because yeah. that's a great scene. Let's get to it then. Come on, we, we've been putting it off long enough. Let's uh, let's take ourselves back to the Daily Bugle, why don't we? And it's so I... difficult because all of these scenes are so great that they do kind of all merge into one for me, all of the Bugle yeah. scenes across all of the films, because uh, they are stand out. Um, the, oh, no, see, I'm thinking of Spider-Man 3 with that one, with um, the, the catchphrase, but that's Hoffman in Spider-Man 3, isn't yeah. it? These are... It's, it's now. It's like you know the moment I'm going to already, and it's one of my favourite scenes. It's one of my favourite yeah. moments from cinema, from film history. It's so difficult for a joke to land when you've watched a film a million times. And I swear to God, it's just as funny now as it is when I saw it back in the day. The J.K. Simmons laugh. Can you pay me in advance? I can't do it. There, There is no one who I can know. do that laugh apart from J.K. Simmons. I would love to be able to do that laugh. I can't. I'm not going to do it. You know the scene I'm talking about. Yeah. It is cinematic, think... per comedic perfection. Every line, every aside. There are so many in this one. It's like, Mr. Jameson, your wife is on the line. She says she lost a checkbook. Thanks for the good news. Like, <laughs> that, that, you spend any more money on this wedding, you can pick the daisies off my grave. Get plastic. Everything. It's perfect. Absolutely perfect. Hey. And I, I can't quote them all because I need to save some for my favorite scenes and favorite moments. But, I mean, I don't know what else we can say about J.K. Simmons as Jonah J. J. Jonah Jameson that we didn't already last week and probably yeah. what we're not going to say next week as well. It's just a joy. Absolute joy. What, what I'll say about that is, you know, every time on screen, you're going to get a good scene. And that's a guarantee. Mm. That, that's that's Joe's 29-minute pizza promise. That Joe's <laughs> that. And in this one, 
is it's like it goes to a new level that it was already great i think if you really stem it down spider-man's like okay we're onto something jake is in he's pretty great at being an antagonist and it's like okay so what do we want to do this time uh, well if you have spider-man quit why don't why don't we just give him the suit and it's uh, i'm not talking about that awful wearing it thing i know people do like that scene but the concept of you know when he's talking to the the guy, I mean, you got to think eBay in two thousand and four wasn't big. Mm-hmm. That was at the time. It was this weird online thing, and he's like, you know, chucking a bar of soap, and it's just <laughs> <laughs> it's so it's, it's so funny. <laughs> and every, I don't think he has a single bad line in the no. entire film. And I think what sells me on the laugh, and which is the the biggest thing, I think Robbie is the most underrated of the Beagle lot. Because he, because he's always been the one that has a sense of pride. He likes Spider Man. He cares for him. He doesn't agree with Jonah. He's always been the whole one. But even he smirks when Peter Parker asks for events. And I think that's what sells it to the next level mm-hmm. is Robbie's reaction to it. And I just think when you have those people together on screen, I just again I say I don't say this about many films. I would just love to be on set. Like again, is it improv? Like Miss Dickovich, like is there a genius writing these lines that should be doing comedy full time? Or is this JK Simmons on the spot? And they're telling me just, just go be an insane boss for the day because everything's great. And, and even the, 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 the doc Ock scene we spoke about earlier, you know, mm. joke. It's the fact that Hoffman at the start first recommends Dr. Osmond. That didn't click me as a kid until a couple of years later. And it's just the way they can go back and forth with everyone. And, Argument with his view, but anything he says, he says with such confidence that it can't be mistaken for weakness. And I think mm. that's why J. Jones Jameson is so great because he never gets it wrong. And I just, I, I can, I, I haven't even spoke about the the bloody the, the scene at the um the high high dining society, whatever he mentions. And <laughs> we meet his wife, who I, I, I yeah. know we'll at the end, but just the other parts when it's like picture, picture, and it's just. I don't. I hate using the word career defining performance from J.K. Simmons, but you know, I, I I don't think without not not to discredit J.K. Without J. Jonah Jameson, would we have got Whiplash? Maybe, maybe. Point. Yeah. Uh, to me, Whiplash has always been an extension of J. Jonah Jameson. <laughs> yeah. It's it's like the. Uh, I, I'd love to see that Whiplash side to J. Jonah Jameson. It, it's like the Peter Capaldi thing in Doctor Who. It's like we yeah. know what this man's capable of like just let him let loose um yeah there are so many other is this the one with hoffman when he's like um uh, does no one care about what i want i do shut up get out is that this one next or is that one, spider-man one. one? Oh, is that no, the next no. oh, see this is what i mean i'm getting them all tied because all of them i are think just so, it's so actually no, i'm questioning i think because they will merge into one i think that's why it's so easy to do it um but i, I love the bit where you know he's he's genuinely mournful like at the at the departure of spider-man that he's no longer a thing he's got no one to hate now and he's he's like come around to the idea that yeah he was a hero but it, it genuinely seems like I, I think he was he wasn't just like spouting off there like i think he was genuine you know genuine about it that you know spider-man was a hero i didn't see it and on a dime straight away it's back to like i want spider-man you know he's a menace he's a thief he's a crook but the moment you talked about, I think it's Robbie as well, where they've got the suit. Isn't he like holding the mask and he kind of is really, really remorseful? Tight. Like he, he holds the mask like, oh, God damn, we need Spider-Man. It's nice yeah. little moments like that are just perfect. Um, I, I think we've already mentioned the uh, the astronaut line, but the bit was like, my society photographer got hit in the head with a polar ball. You're all I got. Big party tonight for an American hero. My son, the astronaut. Because <laughs> <laughs> we know that parents are like that sometimes, right? Yeah. They're always like, yeah, it's just... Oh, it's God. the fact he's genuinely an astronaut. And I think yeah, that's I funnier. Yeah. He's like, done well for of himself. Course, of course, J. J. and Jameson had the son that became... Not like you'd expect like football player or something, but like mm. astronaut. And it's just so... He's just so great. And... Uh, you know, credit to the actor of the son that he doesn't look like Jay Jonah as well, because that would have been too easy for them to have mm-hmm. done, wouldn't it? Like trying to get a look alike, but uh, he just adds a whole new dynamic to the film. Um, I could go on about him. I don't know, we, we, could, got, we, we will could. next week. Next week we will. <laughs> so we get more next week. But let's let's talk about music as we always do, mm-hmm. Danny Hoffman. I know you know you know a bit more about me behind the scenes. Well, I, I, probably... I don't know loads about it, but um, 
I mean, if, if we're just talking about the score, it's, you know, it's another solid one. You get all the themes yeah. that were, you know, made from the first film. And when they kick in, you know, a, as those themes build across the films, my God, you know, that's one of the most consistent things. Even though Elfman didn't do the soundtrack to three, the fact that all of those themes would, you know, thank God those themes were continued until the third one. Um, it's a solid score. I love the Dr. Octopus theme. I like that everyone gets themes. The themes kick in when they absolutely need to. Um, but um Elfman has gone on record with this film saying that he had a really miserable working relationship with Sam Raimi on this film. I don't know if it was a conflict of interest. I don't know if Raimi was ultimately quite pushy. Elfman likes a lot of creative freedom as a composer. He mentions that he hates things like temp music where a director will have a track that he throws into the edit where they'll do some like rough cuts to to kind of get the pacing. Then they'll get a composer in and they'll basically say to the composer, just make it like that temp track that I've thrown in. And the composer might be like, no, I want to do my own thing. And it's like, eh, just make it sound like that. So I don't know if a lot of that stuff went on with this film or if it was just Raimi wasn't a great collaborator, didn't offer many ideas or he didn't let Elfman do his thing. I don't know. I did look for interviews. He just I think he just mentioned that he had like a really bad working relationship on this film and he had a really miserable time with it, which is why he didn't come back for Spider-Man 3. Um, since then, obviously, they must have patched things up because I know that he was the composer on Oz the Great and Powerful, which I still haven't seen. And I think you mentioned he's doing the soundtrack to um, Doctor Strange 2. So, you know, they're back together. They patched it up, but it's a solid score. And once again, that intro with the artwork this time, recapping the events of Spider-Man 1, which is something they do once we get to Spider-Man 3 as well. Something that I always look forward to. And, you know, in the hypothetical multiverse world where we got Spider-Man 4, 5 and 6, would we have had that artwork going back to all of the previous ones? That would have been a bit excessive, I think, getting to Spider-Man 6 and we're still getting glimpses as to what happened in Spider-Man 1. But yeah, when those themes kick in, it's just it's what it's all about, isn't it? It's just th that perfect layer to Spider-Man. And as I mentioned last week, up there for me with, you know, John Williams' Superman March, with Danny Elfman's Batman score, any of like the famous superhero scores, this is right up there for me. Top three, easily. Yeah, it's what he did with that first one that I think for the first one he created such iconic themes. And it's a solid score, but so much of the Spider-Man score is obviously that main theme being not not I hate, I hate using the word rehash, but they they do different things with that theme. I think in Spider-Man Two, you're able to bring in a new dimension to it, and and I think the Doc Ock stuff is so good, and it's such a polar opposite that obviously Green Goblin's theme doesn't sound like Spider-Man's, but there's a lot of similarities if you put them side by side. Uh, instrument wise, audible, it's not too dissimilar, whereas Doc Ock is so well suited to his character, to the tentacles, the, the choice of instrument. And I think Dan Elfman really went to the next level with this film, that he just builds off what came before. And it's a shame, because it, I think because Spider-Man 3 score is so good, and we'll, I guess another time, I don't know how said we'll get to next week, but you would never have known that wasn't Dan Elfman if you didn't know. And I think mm. that's a credit to Spider-Man 3 and also credit to Spider-Man 1 and 2 that he made it his own. There's nothing in this which doesn't sound like it doesn't belong. And I know it's obviously not on, on Danny Elfman, but even using um, raindrops keep falling in my head. Mm. That's on the official soundtrack when you when you watch it, 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 listen to it, sorry. And it's such a good score, but he just, I think Danny Elfman just gets this character. Now, I'm not as familiar with his Batman work. I know the main theme and I've, I've, I've not seen Batman Returns in such a long time. I, I wouldn't even comment on that. But I think when Danny Elfman is on the top of his game, I think he's honestly one of the best around. And I think he creates so many unique scores that not that they sound the same, but I think he is in that elite bracket on his day when he wants to do something yeah. different. He can, he can, you could put his scores side by side and you'd, you'd never know they were done by a different composer. And I think there's a reason a lot of directors like working and they all seem to go back to him again, even falling out of Raimi, he still, you know, he still went back to him and, and he's doing a couple more. So, it's a really curious soundtrack, and I'm going to use this really quick moment just to moan to say that I don't know why they've never released this or the first film on vinyl OST. Maybe next year's the anniversary, who knows? But it's such a good score, and mm -hmm. it's just that it's again, I'm going to say it that main theme. You didn't need to change anything from the first one, but he did, and those credits are just beautiful because yeah. some composers will change, and I guess even within Spider Man, they switched composer to Zimmer on a May Spider Man 2. And it's so different, distinct sounds of the Spider-Man. It's almost like a reboot of a theme, and you don't want that. And and I think also Elfman just set such a high standard it can never be topped. 
it you know from the opening bar of the the theme as well at the very beginning we, we talked about it last week when that columbia logo comes on that commands yeah. your attention that that gets me as hype every single time as i mentioned it last week 20th century fox with the original star wars trilogy um you know new line new line cinema has done loads of films but you know lord of the rings i always think of that when i think of this but when that Colum- even now films that aren't even related to spider-man when i see that columbia logo yeah, I always think of those strings kicking in and the build, and it's like, oh, it's building, it's building, and then you get that amazing intro, and you know, sadly, I was, I remember being there as well for Amazing Spider-Man. That's a conversation for review for a few weeks' time, but it's like it's not the same. I, I want that theme. Like, I have a certain expectation at the beginning of a, a Spider-Man film, and it's it's not being met. And in my opinion, with the music, it hasn't been met. I know that you love the the Chikino score, which I think is fine, but nothing is as definable or as memorable as no. this one that could be nostalgia talking but i genuinely believe that i think Al- elfman knocked it out of the park and i will say i think christopher young took it to an even further level with spider-man 3 i love the score for that one uh but we'll be talking about that next week favorite scenes i mean christ alive it's like the whole film we've, we've probably t- we've probably quoted every single jk yeah. simmons line in this review alone um other favorite scenes my god we've, we've done the dick I feel of like bond. we should be doing favorite quotes as well as scenes yeah oh we're we gonna have favorite quotes in there i'm gonna throw a few in there uh another jk simmons one the very end of the film he's just witnessed his son get stood up at his own wedding and it's like call deborah the caterer tell them not to open the caviar perfect ending for his character that is J- that is j jonah jameson uh just completely money obsessed every bugle scene that's just you know that's going to be default even next week's um bruce campbell uh, as the usher um so just every time he gets cast in one of these films it's just great you know brilliant working relationship with sam raimi um and and he's tremendous he's just playing an absolute dick in this one i think my favorite one is next week once we get to spider-man 3 uh by country mile very over the top but i love that stuff with spider-man 3 so i like seeing his character back and Oh God! Why, why did I even forget to talk about this? The, the goddamn train sequence. I was thinking that we've not spoke about it yet. How and... have we gone an hour and a half not talking about the tra- train sequence? Not only the best action, the best scene of Spider-Man on screen doing what he does best in in film out of all the Spider-Man live action films, it's probably one of the best superhero action scenes out of any superhero film that's ever been made it's it's tremendous just seeing that for the first time the intensity of it and it still works now the the effects work on it is absolutely second to none the choreography the bit where he's like you know skimming through the street underneath the bridge and then he's on top of the train they're on the side of the train they're in the train they do so many creative things with this and you know you can you can joke all you want about the whole the expression the face and he's like straining it is meme worthy and that's why we love it but it's so intense for an action scene and it's like, okay, well, what can we do with Spider-Man? We've seen him swinging through. We've done the clock tower scene. We've seen him swinging through the streets. Just getting him on a train. Had there been like a train action sequence in a superhero film before then? Now I'm thinking of like Wolverine. I know they did like a train sequence um, in, in, in um, that film. 2004. Not, not that I can think of that many. Wolverine, yeah, that's 2013. So train that's sequence. your that's biggest set question. piece i would say from the film though and it it delivers yeah. and it still holds up now it, and the effects work just looks so good from everything in there all the spider-man believe, action is just great to see i believe originally that in spider-man one they wanted to do green goblin and doc ock together mm-hmm. and there were two scenes in mind from that very original uh not draft but like sony pitch and it was goblin on the bridge and doc ock on a train fight sequence so it's obviously something they carried over, probably on pre-production on the first one, saying that, okay, we'll, we'll do it next time. And I think the train sequence is great. I think, you know, some people like laugh at the whole Jesus stuff when it's the whole, like, carrying his body. But yes. people find... It's, it's cheesy on the nose, but I, I love their reaction. Like, he's just a kid. I'm like... He's in his, like, <laughs> it's, 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 it's fine. Yeah. I'll, I'll take it. But it's... um. It's a really good action. And it's also, it's him saving people. Like, it's, yeah. not, you know, it's not just the fact you've got to fight. And arguably, one of the best ever transitions in cinema history is the shot of swinging. And it's actually his sunglasses the whole yeah. time. That is such a good shot. But I is think this the one with train... the slingshot, by the way? I wanted to mention that where he, he webs and like pulls himself back and slingshots. I, I, I'm getting them he all mixed that, up now. Is he, that this one? He does that in this one. He does it in a couple of them. He does that in this. It's uh, the bank fight. Where he's That's on it. the, it's like a sweatshop, which doesn't get spoken about enough. But 
Uh, he yeah, he fires through. That's when Art May. Hits oh, he goes towards. Yeah, that's right. Because I remember that you could do that in the video game, and it doesn't tell you that you can do that in the video game. We saw the film, and we wanted to kind of put in practice what what we see in the film. So you know, you kind of gravitate yourself. You'd web the two webs, and you'd pull back on the analog, and you try and like. Mm. About, and you could actually do it. You could actually do the slingshot move in the game. So yeah, that always sticks out in my mind too. It's it's a really good it's a really good moment. But like just going back to the train thing as well, mm. it's just inventive that you know saving the people, like throwing them off, putting little webs underneath them, and that driver getting knocked out. Uh, speeding. He's the train so up. sassy as well. That driver. Any more bright yeah. ideas? It's like I'll just let you die then, shall I, Mister Driver? Like I'm trying here. And and, and that's the thing and. I think Tobey Maguire handles him so perfectly and it's the epitome of it. And also it's, I, I don't want to say it's a commentary on the first one, but when it's like, you're going to have to get through me and me. And it's like, is this going to be another, you mess with one of us, all of us, but Green Goblin is just not sorry. Doc Ock's just like, <laughs> easy, easy. He's mine. And I just love that. It's so minor, but it's funny, but it, it brings character. And I think the one thing this film, these ones have done, is that it reflects the character of Spider-Man on New York, that he is the symbol for their city, for the state. And I don't think films have done that since that. Mm. Not not even the term for for Spider-Man, but they're behind him because they know his worth, especially in that first film when they did the whole divide type stuff. Whereas this one just reinforcing, I don't think they did that in the Garfield films and they've definitely not even bothered going into central New York for the Holland ones. So it's a really interesting dynamic. And we talk about like the modern day aspect as well. And I think I mentioned this last week, so I'm not going to go into it as much depth as I did last week. But this train sequence, just how enduring it is, the PS4 game, it gets a reference. And there's the train sequence in that game. Yeah. Um, the beginning of Into the Spider-Verse. Yeah, like they still go back to this. They know how good this scene is. You know, they don't go back to any other action scene, really. You know, they, there's nothing from Spider-Man 1, Spider-Man 3. Spider-Man 3 has some great action sequences, but it's always this one. I think this was like, oh, wow. Like I remember, you know, finally seeing that train sequence probably when I got it on DVD and just absolutely being bowled over of how amazing the sequence was. And I don't think we'd even seen superhero action like that at, to that point. You know, obviously we'd had the, the X-Men films and you, you had the cool... Um, like White House sequence at the beginning of X-Men 2 with Nightcrawler and some cool stuff in there. But seeing Spider-Man doing what he does best and you can see that money on the screen as well. They they up the ante so much. And you go back to Spider-Man 1 and we love it. The action feels very small scale in that film. There's like the scene where they they slam into the into the balcony wall, into the building with the glider. There's some awkward punches. This one, you've got everything. It's like it's so creative what they get spider-man doing as well the move set that he's got the way that he moves the the choreography and everything how the fight sequence are orchestrated you can tell that this was storyboarded this was planned to the t and it's just pulled off fantastically well and just the fact that he is saving people like that's all i need in my superhero films you know i'm not gonna hype on you know harp on Man of Steel, but just moments like that is what makes a superhero film a superhero film for me. If you'd have just had like Doc Ock just flinging people and Spider-Man's like, oh, I don't care, I'm just going to go for Doc Ock, that would have bothered me. But the fact that he does take that time to grab the people and web them up. And I mean, I don't know who goes to rescue those people. They're high up. They're like, <laughs> they're like as high as the skyscrapers, but you know, he's trying. So I'm trying to think of any other favorite scenes. It's just, it's just such a well-made film. The whole film. Beginning to end. Yeah. Um... The, I love the Doc Ock's origin scene, um, starting mm -hmm. off with the, the rubber band joke, um, which I think was always... <laughs> I thought that was funny as a kid. And it's a terror As I grew up, that's a terrible joke, but it's very funny still. He admits it's um, a terrible joke, though, so it's fine. And that's why, yeah. But I just love the whole sequence, that the, the fact that his project is working, and it's just the moment the paperclip goes. And everything, it's so well done. Obviously, then you get it mirrored, I guess, at the ending as well. And you know, this mm -hmm. one's wireless, it's self sustaining now, all that kind of stuff. And you know, it, it's just a really great way to bring him in and talk about like sort of tragic villains and whatnot. It's the origin of the villain. And I think this is what I love about these films that we get the villain's origins, we're not told it via backstory, we get to witness it and, and a character be a key part of why they've ended up being the way they are. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of sort of like final thoughts, but also kind of like what we hope to see from Duck Hock as well. At the end of this film, he died. Like, I don't care what anyone said. You yeah. see him dead, his lifeless body in the water, sinking with his creation. It's a beautiful, poetic ending. We know that's not going to be the ending to his character now, whether he did die there. And this is a multiverse Duck Hock that we've got in the new film. It looks like it's a continuation because he knows who Peter Parker is. And it, it seems like it is the one that we know. Um, I mean, they've got to explain that because he was quite clearly lifeless and dead at the end of that film. But you know, the fact I did that keep we are out. Getting... I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I when I saw it, I was like, I was like, ah, oh, the lights are on, and then the lights fade on the things and the sun. It's like goes the Terminator eye, like... isn't it? Where it just like, mm, like just are we... out. Uh, this is my uh, my big thing for the new one is when they announced Doc Ock coming back. I'm very. I don't want to say worried. Because to me, these rain films will exist. I think because of all the multiverse stuff, it's not going to be like the end of Endgame where you you put the stones back in the right place in time. I just think it's going to be another verse. I I am okay with the concept of him coming back, dependent on how they react to Tobey Maguire with him. Mm-hmm. Um, because they have said already. Well, if anyone hasn't seen it, it's not really a spoiler. But uh, why do I keep drawing a blank on Alfred Molina's name? Um, <laughs> He did that interview at the start of the year when he gave a... Uh, no spoilers as such, but it was like, yeah, I'm in it. Yeah, they've de-aged me. Yeah, there's claws. <laughs> I get to fight Spider-Man. And everyone was like, why is he doing this? And and then he said, you know, oh, you know, I'm drowning in one minute and then the next I'm in the multiverse. And, and I'm like, okay, so is the multiverse portal going to pick you out after you drown? Or is it going to pick you up from another scene in that film? And I think that's my question now. Mm-hmm. Do you mean it hypothetically if I've just not been this character for 17 years? Or did he mean it as a this is going to happen in that scene? Where I'm just well, maybe we're just going to see him, and it, you know, someone's going to say like, "How are you back?" And he will just say, "The dark side of the force is a pathway to many abilities." <laughs> Some considered to be unnatural, we'll never get an explanation. I, I really hope we do get an explanation for it. I don't know. Maybe it's the energy, you know, of the the something. I don't know. Maybe he's going to be like Gandalf the White, and he was sent back until his task is done. I don't know. We'll, we'll find out in a month's time, but. Um, it's just it's that nostalgia isn't it it's the Raimi hype and i know that you know we did our ghostbusters review i kind of harped on the whole nostalgia thing nostalgia is a powerful thing this is different though because this is continuing this is like you know an amazing spider-man 3 this is a spider-man 4 and it's also the third entry in this you know in this new trilogy of spider-man films so it's having to do a lot but because i hold these films so near and dear to my heart and especially the character of doc Arc, you know we want to see justice done by these characters we want to see these characters back and hopefully done well so i guess we'll find out in a month's time but i you know thinking of any other favorite scenes from this it is literally just the whole film and i think we've pretty much combed through the entire film in general so final thoughts for me uh this was an absolute delight going back to um i knew it was probably you know if spider-man 1 still holds up well i was damn sure that spider-man 2 would it's easily one of the best films in its genre um quite rightly so almost 20 years later it's still head and shoulders above loads of other um, superhero films and again it's just because it's a tightly ripped film there's not a single wasted scene in the film there's so many quirky and weird characters in there but they don't feel out of place they feel like it's part of sam raimi's charm and part of the world and they're memorable they're memorable character actors that just add to that kind of sort of weird wacky tongue-in-cheek feel to the film but nonetheless there's still a lot of heart to it it continues the elements of the story so many elements from spider-man one of all the characters but predominantly peter parker in in such a fantastic way um it doesn't repeat the same character arcs it's building and building building on everything setting up for a beautiful third act which we'll talk about next week a wonderful villain perfectly realized from the page with dr octopus there isn't a single bad thing to say about this film. It is it is truly a, just a masterpiece in the superhero genre for me. Yeah, this is easy. One of the, the the best, I don't even want to say comic films. You talk about great sequels, and this is in that territory of a mm-hmm. sequel that is greater than the original in every sense of it. And it just encompasses the character, and it's it's amazing to look back almost 20 years later. And it's, it's not unfair to say that films, you know, look better 20 years later, but how many films do we look at 20 years later and the market is oversaturated with content from that. And this, and the ones that are there before it's big. I'm talking about this. I'm talking about Dark Knight, which I'd say, I think 2010 onwards, the comic book films have been insane. I mean, obviously, mm-hmm. I like watching them. I enjoy them. I read a lot of the comics growing up and, and at that age as well. But the fact that it's like the, the OGs, and I saw this poll recently on Twitter. And it was like, you know, Blue Pill 
noughties comic book films, Red Pill tens comic book films, and you just saw like Spider Man two next to the Dark Knight poster, and you just there like there, there's no competition. Like mm-hmm. yes, we've got a Logan, yes, there's other things, but it's it's the the heart that these films have. The films are characters within themselves. That there is a love and craft. It it isn't part of. I mean, yes, it's a corporate company that own it and create it, but it's not some corporate megalomaniac. This is film number eight of the 23, for you to understand 24. This is yes. simply a sequel to the film, and you can see the passion and the love that comes with it. And and I think that passion is shown by every single person involved from the, not that it's important, but the costume design changes, although minimal in this film, have a tremendous impact on, on the costume, the colouring things. Everybody involved has such a care and, and care for attention detail of these characters is just incredible and backed up again by another insane supporting cast with the writing with the direction it is a, a very few times i'm going to justify saying this is a perfect film mm. and this is and i think adding into the word perfect is rewatchability you can put this on if you're in a good mood a bad mood whatever this is going to lift up your day mm. and take it to the next level absolutely and i think just like final final thoughts for me is that Back in 2004, you didn't have superhero films coming out left, right, and center of you. You didn't have like four or five comic book films a year, plus Disney Plus shows. You had Spider-Man 2, and that was like your big one for that year. And then you might have an X-Men film another year or something. And then you'd have the long wait until Spider-Man 3. And, you know, there wouldn't be everything leaked constantly. The internet was still very much in its infancy. So it was, you know, you'd be getting empire magazines like you mentioned at the beginning or whatnot and getting like every shred of information you can i think spider-man 3 was definitely the internet trailer age for me you know that sweet spot you had like at world's end pirates of the caribbean you had spider-man 3 they were the big ones um but yeah so it it felt more special i guess is what i'm trying to say when you had like a film like spider-man 2 come out now it's just like oh yeah we've got like you know eternals one two three four they're on like a a 12 picture deal we know that they're going to be coming back whereas this one we kind of, you know, we saw the film, then we were blissfully ignorant until the next one came out. Simpler times, and I miss those times, but um, that will do it for our review on Spider-Man 2. So obviously, we've we've almost got to two hours on this one, not quite as long as the first one, but we want to hear from you guys now. Let us know what you think of Spider-Man 2. Is it your favourite Spider-Man film? Do you think it still holds up after all of these years later? Maybe you don't like it. I mean, I have yet to meet someone who doesn't like Spider-Man 2, but you could be one of the few if you are. Uh, Let us know your reasons why, and be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Uh, Of course, next week we'll be capping off the trilogy with Spider-Man 3. Uh, That's going to be Wednesday, the 1st of December, uh, exactly the same time of 8pm GMT. Um, We have a lot to say on that one. But you know what? I'm still... I like Spider-Man. I enjoy it still. It's it's flawed. We know the reasons why. You know we can point fingers at um, a certain someone, which we will next week, uh, and it ain't Sam Raimi. So we'll be talking about Spider-Man three, and then obviously moving on from that point onwards. Um, but yeah, what else do we have coming out on the channel after the Spider-Man stuff? Oh God! So next Tuesday we have Johnny English, uh, and I almost said returns all of them. No, this is we're only doing one, the last one, the the first one. Sorry, the only one that matters. So that's going to be this Tuesday. That is uh, going to be at 8 p.m. as usual. That's capping off, I guess we can call it, the Bond-related content for the year, shall we say, that we've, we've looked at a few parodies since. We've done the Bond films, and we're going to use this. as We've, we've had a pretty few intense weeks. December, there's a, there's a lot happening as well. We've mentioned the Spider-Man trailer. We do have a reaction that Meanie did at, what, 1.30 in the morning when that went up. Uh, we've got a playlist, Journey to Nowhere Home, where you can find the Spider-Man 1 review, the, the Tom Holland reviews, and a lot of other things. So if you're into your Spider-Man, into your Marvel, this is the place to be. There's a Hawkeye review on the channel as well now. And Chris, we also have another series happening, carrying on this Thursday. If you want to talk more about that as well? Yeah, we do indeed. So um, kind of, well, not completing, but we kind of putting a pin in it for now. Uh, we've got the Frighteners review. That's going to be this Thursday, the 25th of November at the slightly later time of 10 p.m. GMT. Uh, that has actually already been pre-recorded as the time that this goes up. Uh, it was very funny talking about and hyping a Danny Elfman score with this film and absolutely slating the Danny Elfman score from that film. But uh, it's a fun discussion. That's me and Tate on that one, obviously going through all the Peter Jackson films. And then the month of December, we're going to be hitting Lord of the Rings month and we're going to be covering those films. And then that retrospective is going to continue into the new year with King Kong and the Lovely Bones. So check that one out. The Frighteners is a very, very strange film. It was a very interesting conversation. 
Um, but I think that'll do it for our video now. So obviously our social media is going across the bottom of the screen there. Not only do we have that content coming out, but we will be announcing a lot more content into that month of December, which, oh my God, I can't believe we're almost at December. We're a matter of weeks away now, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so Twitter, you can find us at cinema underscore savvy, Facebook and letterbox.com slash cinema savvy. And of course we have a link to the T public link in the description down below uh, where you can pick up some merch. Uh, I think there's t-shirts, there's hoodies on there. There's a bunch of everything. So go and check it out if you feel so inclined. That'll do it for our Spider-Man 2 review, folks. Until the next video, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.